A quorum being present, this town meeting is called to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A few quick announcements before we start. First, um, just an explanation of Monday night. When the hour was getting late on Monday, there was some confusion as to how we proceed with the motion under Article 16 and what nights we could adjourn to. Let me explain. We had a motion to table the motion under Article 16. As I explained on the first night of town meeting, tabling is a method of temporarily putting aside a motion so that the body can take up something else. Although we generally allow a brief explanation and reason, it is non-debatable and requires only a majority vote. If a motion is tabled, it remains on the table until someone makes a motion to remove it, and that motion is successful. Otherwise, it remains there indefinitely. Tonight, for example, the motion under Article 16 was in fact tabled, so we would move on to 17 unless someone moved to take it from the table, and I believe we are going to have someone do that. Uh, next, there was a concern about town meeting being only posted through this evening. In fact, once town meeting is underway, it's only town meeting can decide when we reconvene. According to our bylaws, we meet on Mondays and Thursdays, so logically, if we don't finish tonight, we would adjourn until Monday. We have checked and the hall is available. Uh, before we go any further, the town clerk has a quick announcement. I have been approached by citizens wanting to reach town meeting members as well as town meeting members wanting to be able to reach out to fellow members all via email. The town clerk's office has been collecting email addresses of town meeting members and although this subjects members' emails to public records requests, we have not given out private email addresses. I am working with our technology department to create nine email groups, one for all town meeting members and one for each precinct. A link will be provided on the town meeting information page on the town website as you see on the screen above. Please contact me with any questions, concerns, or if you would like to opt out of being part of the email group. If you, don't, if you didn't get an email from me today, I don't have your updated email information. Please contact me with, any, with your current email information if you would like to be a part of the group. Thank you. Okay, as I stated on the first night, we try to let the body know if we have any instructional motions on the last night. Where tonight is a possibility we could end tonight, I will read the instructional motions that we have, which may or may not be made at the time at the end of the meeting, but this is what people have said they may make. First one. Direct the select board, school committee, and any other bodies or individuals. And we, we use the expression quite a bit, who would be the next Ryan Brazier? Well, we're just a month in, but it certainly looks like Marcus Walden is the front runner for the town meeting to include as an option for its use the construction of an early childhood center or any other approach that would allow the school system to expand kindergarten and pre-kindergarten enrollment and to reduce or eliminate the use of temporary classrooms at the elementary schools. In addition, the school space study could incorporate these possibilities. Next one, during the select board school committee, direct the select board and school committee and any other relevant bodies to consider and make recommendations on the membership of a Reading Security Committee that would review, review and make recommendations on ways to achieve appropriate cost-effective security at town schools and school facilities, as well as town government buildings and facilities. Said Reading Security Committee should include the maximum feasible participation by elected officials in town and town meeting members as well as members of the public especially school security teams and parents of school-aged children. Furthermore, a goal of the committee should be to share as much of the information and assessment of progress on town security with elected bodies and the public as is prudent and possible. Number three, move to instruct the bylaw committee to, re to, excuse me, to consider for approval the following amendment to the Reading Home Rule Charter. Said amendment shall be presented first to the November 2019 subsequent town meeting for approval then to the Reading voters at the 2020 town election. Amend section 2.6 vacancies to delete the following language. And without reading it all, it's the piece of the, the uh, charter that would, uh, it allows this body to remove people who have not uh, been at enough meetings. For, uh, number four, move that the town instruct the finance committee to examine authorized but unused debt and to develop a policy regarding if and when it should be reviewed by town meeting 
and revoked or replaced by a new vote and a new authorization. Such a policy should be presented to town meeting in a warrant article at the November 2019 town meeting. The fifth and final one, move the town meeting instruct the select board to present a warrant article at the November 2019 town meeting which revokes the Birch Meadow Field Lighting Debt Authorization or reauthorizes the debt for the remaining four fields or authorizes the use of the debt for general Birch Meadow master plan improvements. Such a warrant article will be developed by the Select Board working with the Recreation Commission and the Birch Meadow Master Plan Subcommittee. As I said, these are uh, motions that may or may not come up, but they have alerted the Chair that they might. And with that, uh, Ms. Alvarado asks for the floor. Alvarado, Precinct 5, move to take Article 16 from the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries, and Article 16 is taken from the table. Mr. Lelasher. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, town meeting members. Um, as we're not sure who may have missed the meeting earlier in the week, and we're going to give a little bit of a review, much faster than we did on Monday, but just in case we miss people. A number of the project team you see uh, will speak tonight. The operational team consists of Lieutenant Detective Rich Abadi. He's a f the former first school resource officer and currently a supervisor of SROs. Um, school CFO Gail Dowd, Facilities Director Joe Huggins and Facilities Assist Assistant Director Kevin Cavuzzi. Uh, two of those members will speak tonight. Uh, the managerial consists of myself, the Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Doherty, and the Deputy Police Chief, um, Dave Clark. All three of us will speak. Uh, the last speaker as part of this presentation will be uh, Select Board Chair Vanessa Alvarado. Um, you can also see, in addition to that formal seven-person team, um, there's others as needed from both school and town staff. And just to reiterate, this capital project is the highest priority of both the superintendent and myself. As we go through this presentation, I'm, I'm going to draw your attention, as will the next speakers, to anything that's been added or changed from Monday night. There's a few things. Um, next steps, again, is the same, um, requesting a $4 million debt authorization to fund building improvements or security improvements. If it's approved, the operational and managerial team just mentioned in the prior slide will finalize the project scope. Um, added to this slide is that formally uh, updates to the school committee and select board will be presented. They've been done in the past as needed. They will now be done on schedule. And very specifically, and I'll circle back to this when I wrap this up uh, last, as the last speaker, there'll be a safety summit for the public uh, in the fall of 2019. The last time we had that was May 2018. In uh, November town meeting, there will be uh, under reports an update to town meeting. We expect to have schematic design done at that point, again, if, if approved. And again, to repeat, uh, it is possible uh, that we will ask to advance $400,000 that is in the FY22 capital plan to be done in November because it is probably going to make sense to do the radio upgrades at that time instead of waiting two years after work is done at the dispatch center. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Dr. John Doherty. Dr. Doherty. Good evening, town meeting members. Uh, would want to just briefly go over again how we uh, got to this point to request for funding. So if you remember from Monday evening, uh, we talked about that a security study assessment was done designed to consider the existing or proposed security systems that we have in our town and school buildings. That's, that assessment took a look at five areas and the funding will address the, what the assessment showed in terms of where the greatest needs were. So the intrusion detection systems, as we know, that's your security alarms and other ways to prevent people from entering the building um, when, when uh, the alarms are on or when, when doors are closed. Uh, access control systems is your key card access systems and, and other ways, uh, key management policies, other ways that, that we want to control 
the access to the buildings when buildings are occupied. Your video surveillance systems, I think, is self-explanatory, but that's your camera and video infrastructure pieces. Uh, mass notification systems and capabilities um, is how we can connect to the community in a very timely fashion during an emergency situation. And then the physical security enhancements, which include creating physical barriers to prevent entrance um, by an intruder. So all of these were looked at as part of the assessment. And as um, once, once the assessment was completed, and, and Mr. Huggins and Mrs. Dowd are going to go over in great detail how that process is going, um, there are five goals that go along with what we want in our security systems. The first three are the ones that are preventative, and the funding is addressing these three areas. So it's deter, we want to make sure deter an event from occurring, and it's to make a facility or an, a or an asset appear unreachable. Detect is to allow for early detection of an attack either before it occurs or early in the attack sequence. And then delay, which is to create a physical or psychological barrier to delay access. So the funding that is being requested will, take, will address where the greatest needs were in the assessment process. So this slide is very similar to what you saw on Monday evening. It really starts reviewing in the next couple of slides, talk about Reading's response. So for the last 18 months, as the security study has been uh, going on and is being re reviewed, um, been taking a look at the recommendations that did not require funding. And, and there was a slide that we showed on Monday evening which were called operational governance. And there was a list, a whole list of bulleted items of the types of things that, that we were looking at. So that is one of the things that's been happening. The things that either were low cost or no cost uh, is, is what we have been working on over the last several months. We also, as part of the study, there is a recommendation that there be a formation of a security governance committee that will consist of the operational managerial building security project team that Bob showed you in, in one of the first slides this evening. And the purpose for that governance team is to make sure that we are developing and we're adopting and we're implementing effectively policies and procedures to protect staff, community, and students. The other piece to this that is, is happening, but like any other change, takes a little bit of time, are the different cultural shifts that, and awareness levels that happen when you are implementing security policies and, and uh, procedures. So for example, key management and how we distribute those keys, the, what roles and responsibilities the people that have those keys have. Uh, for example, we obviously, if we are giving keys to teachers um, or coaches, we would not want them to be giving those keys to students to go and open doors. Um, that would be an example of, you know, the policy or procedure that you'd be using um, for key management. And that's a, that, that would be, you know, we'll, we'll look at a cultural shift. We also have been focusing on uh, reducing points of entry in a building. So when I first started teaching in 1987, the doors were wide open. We didn't have locked doors to, in schools. Um, pretty much every single exterior door was open for, for people to enter. Um, what you will now see and have been seeing uh, if you've been coming to our schools is that there's either a single point of entry or fewer points of entry um, which are monitored um, closely. At, at, at different times of the day, depending on the time of the day. So we are working very hard to try to reduce the number of entry points to our, to our buildings. And one of the other things I think it's important, and I, these questions came up, um, and you know, rightfully so, the other evening, is you know, what, are, are students going to look at, uh, see things differently as a result of the changes that will be made? And, to quote Deputy Chief Clark in the numerous conversations that we've had, the best security changes are the ones you do not see. And it is our goal through both the policies and procedures and the change management process that we are doing and the funding to, 
to address the deficiencies that the assessment is showing our our goal is to make the changes that are things that people can't see or are going to be very very few things that are going to be visible um, that is our goal because obviously we want to have business as normal but we want to make sure that we have the safest and most secure environment for those that are in our buildings some other things that we've been doing <coughs> over the last several months um, is drills and um, by law, we have to have certain types of drills. Uh, we, are, we have to have four um, fire evacuation drills each year, which our fire department we work very closely with um, to implement that. We also have to have a multi-hazard evacuation plan and drills that go with that. And that includes our active shooter drills, which we call ALICE. We have also shelter in place drills. Um, one of the things that we also have as part of our safety and security plans and training uh, are canine searches. And uh, on Wednesday, uh, we had a canine search drill here at Reading Memorial High School uh, in cooperation with NEMLEC uh, in the Reading Police Department. We also are looking at ways to control visitor management um, so that there is a process and procedure when a visitor enters <coughs> the building. Um, and again, these are things that are low cost, but taking a look at um, our procedures in terms of when, when a parent enters or a visitor enters, um, you know, where they report to, uh, badges, uh, things like that. Um, we also do a lot of frequent testing of our existing security measures, when we, especially when we have drills. That is, an, that is a prime opportunity to be testing all of those different measures that we have in place. And we continue, and this is ongoing, this is never going to stop, increase our staff training and situa situational awarenesses of, of different situations um, in a safety and security response um, study or procedure. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Deputy Chief Clark. Mr. Moderator, I wasn't sure, but if the entire group needs to get permission for more than 10 minutes, then I'd ask for that. Okay, is there any objection? Not appearing. Continue. Come on. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. So, for the far as the police response, we're going to talk about the building on existing collaboration. Uh, I know you've heard the term NEMLEC thrown out. I'm not sure if a lot of you actually know what that means. And that is the Northeastern Massachusetts Law Enforcement Council. It's a group of 65 cities and towns that Reading is part of. And they provide a tremendous amount of resources to us in an emergency. We have used them. Uh, last example we used them for was back in February. During a snowstorm, we had a male come out of a house, fire off a gun. NEMLEC SWAT was activated. Within a half an hour, multiple police officers, armored vehicles, canine, hostage negotiators, Incident management teams come out on us. Reading is part of that. Reading actually has a sergeant on the SWAT team, an officer on the regional response team, which if we have a, a child go missing or an elderly person with all times go missing, we call them out. They do searches for us. It's a tremendous, tremendous amount of resources that we have available to us, and that's what NEMLIC is. We're probably part of that, and we provide resources. They provide resources to us. Part of that is the STARS team, which is a school threat team. Both of my school resource officers are part of that. And if there ever was an incident at a local school, these officers would go and respond as well. Same thing, if we ever needed it here, they would send help our way. We have um, members of understanding between the schools, the police, the Middlesex District Attorney's Office about how we handle incidents in the schools, crime versus uh, community-based justice. And we work together with the schools, with the uh, District Attorney's Office and the Police Department on this. We have community-based justice meetings where our school resource officers and my lieutenant detective meet regularly with the district attorneys and other schools in the area and discuss issues going on, instances we've had with people, and help to identify and give help to the people that need it. Of course, you've all heard, Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse, ARCASA, works out of the police station, works very handy with the schools. It's another tool that we have to help reach people. Thankfully to the uh, voters of the town of Reading, they provide, uh, passed the override, and we were able to get a second school resource officer. So now we have one dedicated to the high school, one dedicated to the middle school, and they split the elementary schools between them. 
This has allowed us to become more proactive, be doing a lot more in the school, being proactive with the children, as opposed to being reactive, which we were for years. And school safety plans, I know the schools are all up to date, Dr. Doherty, correct? The town was still lagging, we're working on, but, and we do a bunch of drills. We drill every year with the fire department, we practice active shooter drills, we practice joint command between the fire chief and myself, and active shooter drills not just in the schools but in businesses. That's something we practice every single year. And we're constantly training. And this training has actually had real life help with us. When we've had major incidents in town, all this training we've done has actually allowed us to work better as a team and collaborate with the town resources, with the schools, with the fire department, with the DPW, in coordination for whatever we need. So our officers, my staff, the fire department, the public safety group is working very hard in collaboration with multiple agencies to make sure that we can provide as much safety as possible. And now at this point, I'm going to turn uh, Joe Huggins from Facilities Director will be coming over. Ms. Huggins. Hello, everybody. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is go into a little more um, explanation of the bullets you see up on the screen. I'm just going to give you an update of where we, where we are right now. Um, the initial meetings to review the security study recommendations. In the first meeting of the operational group, we reviewed the assessment and talked about the highest priority items. It was decided that the group would utilize multi-layered floor maps and site plans depicting the suggested location of each security measure at each location. The purpose of this activity was to verify current security measures and how, to, how the suggested enhancements would fit into each location, utilizing a consistent platform across all locations. This was a collaborative a process using feedback from the security experts, law enforcement, town and school officials, officials, and the facilities department. Once the group fully vetted the pr proposed enhancements, our next step was to schedule building tours. So the building walkthroughs, this is what we've been doing. Using the multi-layered site plans, the operational group began touring the school buildings. The process to date has encompassed two days of walkthroughs of the school buildings, and another round of visits is a strong possibility. Walkthroughs of the town buildings are currently being completed utilizing the same approach. The walkthroughs are being completed to verify the accuracy of the plans and the locations of our existing security measures in the buildings and each measure is being looked at as to how the enhancement would work from an operational slash safety standpoint and how we would in integrate into our current systems. Many of the school and town, many of the buildings on the school and the town side that may seem similar as to enhancements recommended are in fact very different due to the physical layouts and the use of each facility. So not every building is going to be the same as far as what gets done to it because of those two things. During this process, the security consultant played a key role in helping us to understand how to best protect each building based on the physical layouts of each of, and the constraints posed by the age and the building infrastructure. The operational group is thoroughly examining the most, most effective ways to execute installation to mitigate the vulnerability and associated, associated risk of each building as outlined in the security study. I'm going to turn it over to Gail Dowd. Ms. Dowd. Thank you. I'm going to talk about the last bullet point out there, just about how we're wrapping this all together after we complete all of the walkthroughs. Once all of the tours are complete, and as Joe just mentioned, we did just complete the school building tours this week, and we are moving on to the town-based buildings. We will be re-examining the suggested enhancement at each location and how they fit into the risk matrix that we talked about earlier in the presentation to make sure that the focus remains on the highest vulnerabilities and threats. So to make sure any of the red items are being addressed foremost in this process. These enhancements will be placed into a matrix that we will utilize to finalize our recommend recommended scope, which resulted from the detailed site plans and building walkthroughs. During this process, and throughout the design, TRC, who is the security consultant that's been involved since the beginning, they will remain on staff to ensure we are following the proposed recommendations from the security study. So that's our ensuring we have consistency throughout the process with external people who are 
experts in the area um, and can make sure we're, we're not straying from our initial goals. The next step will be that the operational team will meet with the executive team, which would be the town manager, superintendent, and the deputy police chief to present and propose the recommended enhancements. Final decisions and determinations will be made in this collaborative process with the executive team, operational team, as well as the security consultants. The final step in the process would then be to begin the schematic design to prepare the documents that would then ultimately go out to bid. And with that, I will turn it back over to Bob to wrap up. Mr. Lillager. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> um, for new town meeting members, one thing that's different about Reading compared to most municipalities is that um, all the town departments and the school department collaborate on a number of things very well. Um, I hope that's evident tonight, but that's, that's a fact and that has made this process much easier. Uh, part of the collaboration that some of our elected and appointed boards do is regularly scheduled what they're called as financial forums. Um, there's usually at least one, there's been as many as three and, as, and possibly four uh, during a budget cycle which starts in September. It's a FinCom meeting, uh, all the other three elected boards are invited, uh, library, schools, and uh, select board. Um, they review budgets and they do review capital. A focus for the 2019 fall financial forum, I'm not sure which month, as described during the winter budget process was definitely capital. Um, it's clear that this will be one of the items uh, scheduled, but there, there are others as well. Um, so there will be quarterly updates on capital projects, uh, including building security, given at school committee, select board, and or financial forums. I wanted to make sure you knew what financial forums were. Uh, for this project specifically, a segment of uh, the financial forums or possibly the others could be an executive session, depending on what material is reviewed. And to be very clear, there will be a financial slash budget review um, at the financial forum of projects underway. Um, the granularity will be summary level, but they'll be sufficient so FinCom at least can see whether something's on track or not. When we did the library project, that type of work was done with the library building committee. Um, as mentioned, at November town meeting, there'll be an update to this body, and most likely there'll also be one next April. Um, something we've added since Monday and committed to do and need your help for is we had one safety summit last May. We're perfectly fine in having more. We'd like to have one this fall before November town meeting and perhaps next spring. Um, but we'd really ask your help to get attendance at those meetings. I'm, I'd be ashamed to say how many were at the May one. Um, these are meant to be listening sessions, much like the override listening sessions were where we had a group of staff come and listen to the residents and listen to the community. What are your concerns? What are your interests? Um, so again, um, we absolutely need your help for turnout. Turnout is, has, has been an issue in the, in the past. And uh, public attendance is really crucial for these meetings to be successful. And then we'll just continue to communicate uh, via media, newsletters, and other normal events um, which you know have have been going on you know we'll pay special attention to um, issues that have come up in the listening sessions that can be discussed in this communication so at that point I just like to turn the rest of the presentation um, the conclusion up to Vanessa Ms. Alvarado thank you mr. moderator um, in the conversations I've had this week, there seem to be some crossover between the depth and breadth of information some wanted disclosed. Um, when we talk about funding and scope of projects, we always talk at the high level. We have professionals in our town and school staff um, who prioritize the need at the ground level based on their expertise. As it pertains to this particular article, um, senior members included some you've already heard from, including Gail Dowd, the school CFO, Joe Huggins, the facility director, Kevin Kabuzi, the assistant facilities director, Deputy Police Chief David Clark, and Lieutenant Detective uh, Rich Abadi. Um, all of these individuals have been working on the question of building security for almost three years. No one knows these buildings better than they do, and their input into this process will make Reading safer. Um, I believe the level of detail in Monday's presentation was appropriate 
and in keeping with the level of detail provided for other types of debt authorization requests. Where there seemed to be a need for more information was focused on four areas. Community involvement, elected official involvement and financial accountability, uh, communication to the public, and internal policies. These are difficult conversations that communities are starting to have. Um, I endeavor to find ways to provide as much information as possible to this town body as you are ultimately responsible for making these types of decisions. In that spirit, uh, on Tuesday of this week, I met with Bob, John Doherty, and from the select board, Mark Doxer, and from the school committee, Elaine Webb and Linda Snow Doxer. Um, we discussed a path forward uh, coming out of some of the concerns that were raised at Monday's town meeting. Bob has now presented the results of that meeting, uh, and I believe this adequately addresses the concerns that were raised on Monday. With these arrangements in place, I do believe we should move forward with this endeavor today. I will be supporting this article, and I hope you do as well. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Yes, over in the, uh, Mrs. Doctor. Oh, I. Did you call me? I, could, I thought I called Ms. Doctor. Did, she, did you have her hand up? Oh, I'm uh, sorry. We'll, we'll go with you, and then right after that, we'll go with I you. Couldn't. Go ahead. Okay, um, Cynthia Cool, Precinct 6. Um, I notice a lot, um, this is hard for me to discuss, but I notice that um, the importance of security in the school is more important than the health of the children. So it seems as if um, we have a very population of children that have psychiatric disorders that, that you know there were a lot of mass school shootings and there's a website SSRI stories dot net NET and anybody can go there where it says school shootings and it says what medications the person was on and what how many children were were murdered or killed or shot or whatever and it's very serious there are actually if you go to that site there are 500 in 5,000 incidences of um, very bad uh, situations that have occurred uh, where these people that were medicated, you know, they had bad response. And according to doctors, um, the, the brain isn't what's wrong, it's what's wrong in the body. And, and the, the upset, the things that are going wrong in the body translate into brain, mis you know, mal mal malworking. But it's all very fixable. It's um, not being taught to doctors, and doctors only get about one hour of nutritional um, studies in their entire curriculum when they go to medical school. But there are many doctors that are trained in it, and they do understand it. And um, the solution is, is to create healthy children. It's not, not surveillance. That's, that's the solution. And I think that the importance of this overlooks the most important part, which is the health of the children. And the easiest way to do, um, to bring the health of the children back to them, is to give them a better diet, whole foods, organic foods, take all the toxins out, take all of the, the bad things out of the foods, and it creates health, health in the child. Excuse me, you seem to be getting off the subject a little bit. Uh, could, well, you, could you direct your comments back again? Well, yes, it was overlooked. It, there's an importance of trying to you know, have active surveillance in the case of an event that happens. Um, somebody's unstable, they come with a gun, whatever, you know. But there's just a huge, <laughs> there's a huge population of people that are actually being prescribed these medications. And according to these, you know, doctors, the side effects of the medications are more erratic behavior. So we have to be very careful how we treat the situation. We can, we can just respond with a knee-jerk reaction. Let's just, you know, surveil. Or we can try to fix it at its root cause, which is the children. This is my point. I disagree at this point that you haven't looked hard enough into this situation and talked to people that understand the situation better than you do and all of us do at this point. I'm not a doctor. I'm a doctor, but I'm not a medical doctor. And I can tell you that there are solutions to this. And it doesn't require everybody in, in the United States giving, you know, needing to surveil everything. It's, it's a matter of treating these children with compassion 
and getting them the help that they need. And drugging the population is not the answer. So that's just all that I want to say. Okay. Ms. Doctor? Uh, Nancy, Dr. Precinct 1. Um, I really wanted to thank town meeting members that uh, tabled this. It gave me a lot of time to reflect. Um, we're being asked to spend a lot of money with a lot of information. And it um, made me remember about two years ago, Chief Segal came to us and asked us to appropriate uh, additional funding for what he termed officer safety equipment. Um, I'm the granddaughter of a police chief. I had no problems with that. In fact, I believe that passed unanimously. Um, I did ask the chief after town meeting what those funds were for. Um, we bought riot gear. Um, I went to the Department of Justice website um, to look at their recommendations for school safety, and it was very reassuring to know that we as a community are actually being very proactive. They give a list, several tiers of equipment, recommendations. They actually even give you the price tags. Uh, you can get a portable metal detector for $30,000. What um, I did find is that this is a very big industry, school security. Um, the sale uh, is based on fear and anxiety. This is a $3 billion industry that actually helped to underwrite the legislation last year, the National School Security Act which should cause us a little concern when a private industry is helping to write our laws. Um, the concern I have is when you start looking at the big ticket items that perhaps are in the $4 million, but we don't know what they are. Um, things like license plate scanners, we can put our parking lots, um, facial recognition systems. See, I don't know what this subgroup determined is the threat to our workplace and our school. Um, I do know when I went to the National Association of School Committees or School Boards, I forget the acronym, they list the two biggest concerns they have in school when it comes to safety is student on student violent and student, um, they term it as disrespect slash violence with teachers. So are these things going to be addressing those concerns? Um, we are fortunate in Massachusetts to have the best gun laws in the country. I have complete confidence in our chief for his discretionary um, rights to limit gun licenses. It gives me a sense of safety. I don't know a lot about this stuff, so I actually called somebody who is more experienced with work violence, workplace violence, and actually, unfortunately, mass shootings. I actually called one of my older sisters. I called my sister Jane because she was sent in 1991 to Royal Oak, Michigan. Um, she was part of the uh, critical uh, debriefing and remanagement after the postal shooting there. Um, and when we talked about this article, and again, there are a lot of big differences about postal shootings, the 11 shootings that occurred over a 10-year time period, and what we're discussing. But the one thing that really stands out for me is, in, 28 years, very little has changed in terms of the underlying issues, which are behavioral health, their senses of disenfranchisement, depression, anxiety, serious psychiatric disorders. I don't see anything in this plan that addresses this. This, to me, is a false sense of security. I understand there's a need for our educators to do something and do something fast to reassure the community. But this is seriously lacking. I think Governor Baker set aside, was it $78 million? Is that correct? Something along those lines for school security? That's a very, very small amount of money that is kind of a feel-good thing. I would like to see something that truly addresses the very nature of this, it was presented on um, Tuesday, the idea of having truly a discussion about what we need to do about violence in our schools and in our workplace. This is not addressing that. The town manager is absolutely correct. There is no empirical data that shows a cause and effect for security and safety. But that doesn't mean there's not data. There is a lot of data. 
The door at Sandy Hook was locked. There were video cameras at Parkland. There is a tremendous amount of data from national educational um, sites that show that video camera cameras actually report a much higher incident of what we call bad behavior, which is what I think a town meeting member was referring to. So I actually think this is a wonderful start, and I commend the subgroup for their work, but I'm not going to support this, because this to me is a false sense of security, unless we are truly going to have some type of intervention or identification. If you're planning to spend the $4 million to hire 20 board-certified child and adolescent psychiatrists, I'm on board. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Brown, Precinct 8. Um, I think we can all agree that the biggest issue facing us, as Ms. Alvarado has noted, has to do with community input. That, to me, is where this proposal uh, seems to fall down. So there have been some discussions, and maybe you could give us some more information about Ms. Alvarado, what it is that you've been reassured about or that you feel has influenced your decision. What kind of participation will you have? Will you actually have a seat at the table or will you have a listening seat at the table? I think those are kind of critical for us to know. Ms. Alvarado? moderator um, so as far as the conversation that we had on Tuesday um, the community involvement portion um, in the form of community input sessions um, that will be an opportunity for the community to address their concerns to town staff um, as Bob mentioned we did things very similar to this during the override process um, so that community members could um, address what they thought their priorities were for the town. Uh, as far as the elected officials go, in executive session, um, I have spoken to Bob, and he has assured me that the financial accounting portion um, will be part of those conversations. I think it's important to note here that when we have projects, regardless of the nature, um, this body is the one that determines whether or not it's a priority for the town. On the other day, we approved 2.25 for Turf 2. That was determined, a million for Turf 2. Um, that was determined to be a priority for the town. Um, when follow-up conversations happen on things like that type of project, we are given updates on the progress of it, um, perhaps what stage of development the project is in, um, if costs are over or under what was anticipated, and these are the types of conversations that would take place in executive session. Um, they are in keeping with how we handle all of our major capital projects. Um, given the presentations that have been given, I am comfortable with that level of involvement. I know that on Monday there was discussion about how we got here. Um, I, th I think um, it was late and I, and I made my displeasure known um, but I think moving forward we're in a good place so I, if you're asking if I'm satisfied with where we are the answer is yes I guess I, I, I'm still looking for a clearer answer do you have a seat at the table or not a seat at the table I think it depends on what you mean so when we talk about the nitty-gritty details, does school X have a security problem on a door? Does school Y have a security problem in windows? Um, that level of detail should be left to the experts. Not a single one of us on either the school committee or the select board would be able to contribute to that conversation in any meaningful way. I'm talking about the kind of the overall plan for what this idea is supposed to be. That's, that's the seat at the table 
I'm concerned about. Mr. Moderator, may I ask a question <coughs> of the speaker? Sure. OK, thank you. Um, may I ask what that would look like to you? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know who proposed the, um, the article at the end of the meeting that might involve, you know. It, I, I think, it, from my point of view, it, for this to become a whole idea, uh, we need to have the input of our elected officials. Because right now, there is no input from any of our elected officials. We don't have any input directly from the board, the select board, the school committee, the, um, you know, the library, board of library trustees, or really, I mean, we're having a discussion here, but either or from someone from town meeting. So we can respond to what's being suggested, but we don't have a, none of our elected officials have, are part of the decision making that is kind of conceiving this whole plan. I think that, that for me is where it really, really falls down and to which, you know, we just heard, you know, I think the plan, if we're really talking about security for our community, needs to be thought of in a broader sense. But because it's kind of come out of this one particular way, you know, you know, looking at it from, a, you know, protecting the buildings and the staff, and I support all that. That's, that's, we need to do that. That's important. But where I think it really, really does fall down is the fact that not everybody who needs to be at the table is at the table. That's where the plan is limited, in my mind. Thank you. Do you have another comment? Oh, Mr. No, oh, sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, one of the slides uh, right there showed that this, the select board and our school committee and others could get information in an executive session. Um, the first such one would presumably be September, possibly October. Um, that would reflect, if this article is approved, uh, what the actual bids came in at and thus what the budgetary plan is. So at that point, we could say something now, but it, it doesn't matter until we have bids. Then before any work is done, these boards will see at a summary level, not a building by building level, what is being proposed and there'll be a full discussion of that. I, I, I hear you, I understand what you're saying, but I just don't think you're, you're uh, getting my lo the larger picture for which I'm concerned. And so I do have some more specific questions. Okay, you're getting I close might. to your time. Okay. Please, please. Can I go to my 10 minutes, please? You get, yeah, getting close. Go ahead. So the security, the security governments committee that we're talking about, who does that report to? Mr. Lelisher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the superintendent reports to the school committee. I report to the board. Um, other employees report to us, so more, more or less. Report to the, the superintendent. Pardon me? It will, they'll start by reporting to the superintendent. Uh, each member reports to either the superintendent or myself. No. Or the, to who school. does the committee, who will the committee report to? The committee as a whole. The committee you're suggesting that you have called the Security Governments Committee, that committee, who will it report to? It doesn't report to any one entity. It reports to several elected boards. Uh, I guess my question is, report to on what matter? On their discussions, on what they're talking about and what they're deciding. Certainly this, this body has no right to pass and, and propose and pass policy. I'm not suggesting that. I'm, I'm, asking I'm just not clear what you're asking then, I'm sorry. Will it have a budget? Certainly not. Okay. Um, if just so that I try to understand again the scope. If, if your committee decides that some 
uh, building or security measures need to be implemented at the library, for example. How does, the, what is the role of the Board of Library Trustees in that decision-making body? In other words, will these, whatever security measures are, are decided upon, does do the Board of Library Trustees have a chance to say, no, we don't, we don't think that's appropriate for the library, or, or do they not have that choice? I'm afraid they're not here to answer that question, but in executive session we did discuss that, and they were very comfortable with the role that they were explained. But you're not answering my question. With but all I due respect. I can't speak for the library trustees other than to say what I just said. Do you believe, do you believe that they have a role in determining whether they can object to any of the measures that may be suggested. This is just an example. Y yes. Or is it a take it or leave it thing? Inside their building, yes, absolutely, they have a right to discuss that and decide. Okay, great, thank you. Ms. Snow, doctor. Thank you, Dr. Linda Snow, doctor. Uh, precinct one. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I have a couple of reactions. Um, one, for me, what makes me very comfortable with the recommendations of this security team, aside from the fact of how much work they put in and research they've done, is that they've gone to the ground, the people that are on the ground working in our, for instance, in our schools, and talk to them about what they perceive to be the security threats. I, per I think that the teachers and the staff and the schools are much more qualified than I am to say what their concerns are. Um, and it would be very hard for me to spend the time um, going to the meetings to be part of those final decisions the way that our staff are doing it right now. And I feel very comfortable that I'm getting reports on this to the level that I need to make those decisions. And, and just, I want to broaden that answer of certainly not, we won't get the, the budget. We will get an overview. Um, we won't necessarily get the little details because that would be not safe in terms of security. As Dr. Darty said, the best security is that which we can't see. And so we can't share that with 26 of our best friends and keep it confidential. I also wanted to comment on the questions, the great points that were put, um, that were brought up by um, Ms. Cool and Ms. Doctor before about the social, emotional, and physical needs of our students. They might, they have actually been mentioned here, and I have also the handout from the Safety Summit in May, and it was articulated in that Safety Summit what the many ways that we are dealing with the safety of our kids, the security of our schools through the health of our students. We have Christian, and I'm talking schools now because um, the, I'm much more um, intimately involved in that, but Christian Moriello, our dietitian, is amazing in terms of finding foods that our kids will be attracted to that are also healthy. And we were able to taste those foods and, and experience how delicious they are. We had whole wheat baked donuts at one of the conferences I just went to. Banana bread, fruit is served with every meal. Frozen yogurt. The, the considerations of the diet of our students is definitely being considered. And just to read quickly, um, this emotional, the social-emotional learning that's being done with our students every day in the school includes in the elementary schools, there's, social, there's open circle, positive behavioral intervention and supports. Middle schools is facing history and ourselves, advisory, challenge days, a world of difference. High school, we've had courageous conversations, guidance curriculum special, specific to the grade. Each school has at least one school psychologist available. This was all information that was given out at the safety, the security summit. So I really encourage everyone to attend these meetings because they're packed, packed with information. Um, and there was, um, okay, and so I feel like I have gotten reports and 
over time, we've definitely been in tune with those psychological elements um, that will catch things as they're brewing. So I'm, I'm grateful to this, this um, project. I'm fully in support of it. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, uh, yeah. you, yep. Sarah Doan, Precinct 8. Um, I've put a lot of thought into this, so I hope it's okay I'm going to read this because I don't want to forget anything. Um, I'd like to give my perspective as a teacher on this topic. I've been teaching for 20 years. Columbine took place during my student teaching, but there was nothing in my college training that prepared me for part of my current job description. Be prepared to make a quick decision that will impact the lives of every child in my classroom in that moment. I didn't go to school to be a police officer or to be part of the military. I went to school to be a teacher. Every time we have an Alice drill, we reflect with our classes on how the process went. Every time they come up with a list of what ifs. While we can't take away every one, we can greatly reduce the number with this article passing. I've been teaching here in Reading for 16 years. While our society and culture has greatly changed over that time, virtually nothing about the physical structure of our buildings has. There's lots of talk about wanting the community more involved in this process. I appreciate that good intent. I too am a mother of children in the district and a taxpayer. We're all emotional about this issue and have reason to be, want to be involved. Um, but for me as a teacher that thinks about this daily, I respectfully only want key people that need to be in this process involved. The more outside people only exposes our vulnerabilities to the larger audience and puts us at greater risk. Uh, it's been said that no other local communities, uh, that we have no other communities to look for as guidance as Reading as a leader in this. If other towns are looking to us, let's have faith in our own community and our own leaders. Let's support this article and do what is within our power to make us safer. Further the discussion, Mr. Bonazzoli. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. James Bonazzoli, Precinct 6. Um, I have a question for um, perhaps Bob or Superintendent. Um, <clears throat> based on the study that was done, it doesn't seem as though we've hit the five points. So I assume that we're at a phase zero, phase one. Mr. Um, Mr. Bonazzoli, do you mean that top half of the slide? Yes. Um, do you have a specific question? Well, if it, I'm understanding what was said. This is an ongoing living project. And we're, we're just trying to address the, um, the immediate need of the physical security to deter, detect, and delay an, an incident in one of our public buildings. Do, do I understand that correctly? The building security broad issue has, I guess, two parts. What is in front of this body is a capital request for stuff, right. and it addresses different parts of these five. There's a lot more to building security than just capital, and perhaps some of that discussion has happened. Policy is kind of a broad discussion of, of all the rest. Um, but all of these are being addressed in some way. Uh, all of these are being done now, and improvements are suggested or needed. I'm not sure if that answers your question. No, it does. Thank you. So, so when, I, when I look at, and forgive me, I wasn't here Monday, but I heard it was a, a great night of discussion. Um, but I don't see this any different from any other major capital project that we've done in this community. We, we've always trusted those who are elected and for them to work with and, and manage the people that are doing the work. That's why they're, they're boards to oversee and, and have the oversight. This is very close to us from a security perspective, but we need to take a step back when you look at how we did our networking of the schools, none of us were involved a part of that, but we made the capital overlay for it. The, the water project, I was on the board at the time. I didn't want to sit at the table to understand how we were going to run the pipes through the town and work with MWRA. I knew it was being done and we were being updated on a quarterly basis. So if I look at the communication page that you had there, Bob, that, that's more communication and input for the community to, to be kept apprised on and, and share input than any other capital pro program I've seen in the 22 years I've been here. 
I'm in favor of this article. I'm in favor of the approach. I appreciate the insight and input. And please continue the good work. Thank you. For the discussion. Ms. Dansmeyer. Dan Dansmeyer, Precinct 7. I move the question. Is there a second? Second. This requires a two-thirds vote. Let's see, I'm missing my counter from the right. Mr. Sasso, can I call on you to count my right as well as the Finance Committee? And let's see, Mr. Crook and Ms. Hillary and uh, Mr. Pacino. All those in favor of moving the question, which ends debate, please rise. Twenty-nine. Twenty-nine. Eighteen. Eighteen. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Thirty-one. Thirty-one. And those opposed to ending debate, please rise. Eight. 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 Thirteen. Thirteen. Twelve. 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 The vote being 102 in the affirmative, 45 in the negative. The question has been moved, and we will now proceed to a vote, which is also requires a two-thirds. So all those in favor of the motion under Article 16, please rise. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Thirty-six. Thirty-six. Forty-one. Forty-one. You had me as twenty-four, or did you say twenty-one? Twenty-four. Twenty-four yes. is correct. Yes. Okay. And those opposed? Two. Excuse me? Two. Two. Okay. Seven. Seven. Two. Two. Zero. Zero. Vote being 135 in the affirmative, 11 in the negative, the motion carries. Business under Article 17. Mr. Lalasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, this is another debt authorization, this one for the Auburn Street water tank replacement. And the current tank is three quarters of a million gallons, constructed over 60 years ago. It's approximately 110 feet high. There should be maintenance painting done um, every 15 years. The last time it was done on the outside was over 20 years ago, and on the inside even longer ago than that, so we're behind schedule. Um, as many of you may know, OSHA is evolving their safety protocol, and uh, in recent years they are very concerned with catwalks we have up on the top of the tank. The tank also has corrosion, it needs repairs. Um, right now there is cell carrier access to the full water tank, which is in the security study, not a best practice, obviously. Uh, in order to uh, repaint the tank, which had been discussed up until the last few years, and had been done previously, we would first drain the tank, then use the Bear Hill tank as the sole source of water for a period of time, which is okay, uh, then repair, paint, and then refill the tank. That would take a period of several months. A few years ago, we uh, considered another option. A new structure could be replaced, uh, re could replace the old tank. It's called CET, or Composite Elevated Tank. It's glass fused to a steel tank on top of a concrete column. Um, there is no maintenance painting required. 
there is some maintenance required, but it's significantly less costly uh, than the current tank. What we are proposing is such a new tank with the exact same uh, capacity, the exact same location, and the approximate same height. The reason I say approximate is because it depends on whether the carrier's equipment is identical to what they have or not. The carriers will have to uh, build a temporary structure, move their equipment off, uh, as I understand it, rather than move that equipment back on the water tank when it's finished, they would replace it with new equipment because technology evolves. Such a new tank would expect it to last for more than 50 years, and again, probably a less sturdy tank has lasted us 60 years, so I, I don't think we have a problem with that. Um, the map isn't terribly helpful other than to say it is going in exactly the same location. To look at the two costs of the two options, um, if we just assume that the new tank lasts only 40 years, which is very short lifespan, um, let's pretend that the current tank uh, to be uh, repaired uh, would have had to be repainted only twice during the 40 years, and again, 15 years is more ideal. If it was only repainted twice, the cost of that would be six and a half million dollars over the 40 years, and that includes other maintenance. If we replace it with a tank, as proposed, that does not require maintenance painting or very much maintenance, uh, the nominal cost, again, over 40 years is less than five million. So over a long period of time, such as 40 years, um, the option we're proposing is cheaper. But certainly in the short run, it's more expensive because we're making a big upfront investment to pay ourselves back over a long period of time. Um, if you were to look at some kind of cash flow or present value analysis, um, we start making out great after year 16 based on current financial markets. So for the first 15 years, we're making an investment in the future. And on page 166 of your warrant, this is proposed as 15-year debt uh, in the Water Enterprise Fund. Um, just to make sure I covered this area, uh, painting also involves, as I mentioned, uh, re removing the cell carriers when painting is done. They have to come off the tank. Um, that usually um, in includes a one or two year loss of revenue because they have a great deal of expenses to move things off the tank onto a temporary structure and then back on. Just so that I was complete again, that's a history of cell tower revenue uh, through the most recently full completed year. So it's, it's been approximately 130,000 for a few years. And uh, we are in negotiations with the carriers. Um, they are, um, there's a lot of consolidation in the industry. Uh, we have met with them regularly. It's actually kind of funny because we'll meet with them and then some of them have changed jobs. So they're in different companies, but they're all still in the same room. Um, and there's, there's experts that sit in the room and they're more loyal to their trade than they are to their company, with all due respect. Um, it's, it's a very interesting industry. The, as, as I mentioned, the current security is less than ideal with them to have full access. The best from a security standpoint would be a standalone separate structure to put their equipment on, not on the water tank. Uh, that discussion happened about 18 months ago at a select board meeting. There was pretty significant neighborhood resistance, so we decided just not to go that path. Um, this solution of a new tank completely will be better than the current um, situation is the carrier access will be reduced but not removed from a new structure. Main comment report, Ms. Perry. The Finance Committee voted 7-0 at their March 13th meeting to support this. Um, I think any time we have an article or any project that we can you know, leverage decreasing our operating expenses is great, and it's got a return on investment. Further discussion? Ms. Whiting. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carolyn Whiting, Precinct 7. Is this an appropriate time to present a am possible amendment? Yes. Um, I would like to add the replacement tank is to be designed and constructed to fit up to three cell carriers. Is there a second? Second. Is it Ms. Whiting? I live in the neighborhood um, right near the, cell, the, the uh, water tank. And um, 
my neighborhood um, strongly opposed when Sprint came in. Um, I think it was around 2000 or so. And my understanding was they were the third and final carrier on the tank. And I don't want to see any additional, you know, there's nothing we can do to keep the three that are there away because of the federal law. But I think if we have a tank and we have space for four, we won't be able to keep a fourth one out. So that's why I'm proposing that we um, construct it to accommodate three or fewer. <laughs> anyway, because I think it's, it's, um, there's a potential harm to people from having um, wireless radiation and uh, we can't regulate based on that, but I think we could say we're not going to you know, encourage anyone to come in. And I think it's bad for property values, too. Thank you. Mr. Militia. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, just to be clear, the town is building a water tank to meet its needs. Um, we don't know what the cell carriers may wish to do. That's up to them. Um, it really comes down, the how many carriers question comes down to how much equipment they have and how much space they need. Um, and from what I've heard, the industry is not actually going towards smaller equipment and consolidation. So again, we're just replacing the exact same structure. It would be as if magically a new tank appeared with the same structure and the carriers will uh, do what they will. Um, we're not adding more capacity for them or subtracting any. Okay, discussion on the proposed amendment. Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ian Brown, Precinct 8. Uh, so I guess I have two questions uh, on this amendment based uh, for Bob. Um, limiting the number of carriers, would that impact pricing? Because normally if you have the more carriers, it's more competitive for lower price on the network. So I guess what, that's my first question. Mr. Lillichair. Um Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I don't see the how that this motion, or this amendment rather, changes what we're doing and the cost of what we're doing. What it may um, come back is in that revenue slide I've showed you, um, when their various contracts are up, which is more or less cons uh, consistent with when they would want to go back on the structure, and we put it out to bid, such a restriction certainly could impact the pricing and the revenue we see, but it won't impact the debt authorization or the costs that we have as, as far as I can imagine. Okay, and my uh, second question is, when you, am I gonna word this? when you restrict the, if you restrict the number of carriers, would they, um, can they, I guess, take legal action against us for attempting to limit the number. <laughs> Mr. Meharis. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, well, first of all, you always can find lawyers who are willing to bring legal action saying almost anything. So, uh, so the answer the first part of the question is, uh, yes, of course. Um, what you really want to know, I think, is if somebody attempted to, um, uh, uh, to bring a, uh, an action of this sort, how would it fare? Um, the town is under no obligation to lease its own facilities um, to um, anyone. So if we choose not to lease, our, uh, lease the facility, there's, I think, no cause of action. The real question is if we don't make these things available um, at the water tower, uh, what will happen next? And what will happen next is that, is that uh, a carrier will be able to demonstrate that they uh, don't have proper access and uh, could conceivably force the town to accept a facility in a place we don't like, want it at all. So it's a risk you take. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? <laughs> yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Greg Savatelli, Precinct 6. 
Can you ref um, let us know, does this actually, does this amendment actually fit within the confines of this article because it's about funding the water tower and doesn't say anything about the cell well, structures in there? It or? is a close call. I actually thought about this for a while. Where we have cell towers and have for a long time and we are building a new one with that in mind, I have decided it is within the scope. But I understand your question. Okay. And then in terms of three versus four versus two, I mean, is there any real, is there, is there studies on whether the, you know, order of magnitude going up in number of carriers actually affects anything from, you know, for, from the, the concept of health and other things in the town for those residents that are nearby? Mr. Lewis here. Um, thanks, Mr. Moderator. I'm, I'm going to ask it, I'm going to answer it in a very different way. Sure. The amount of carriers does not necessarily reflect the amount of equipment. So if there is a concern, and it would normally be based on the amount of equipment, um, that's the correlation I just don't see. Um, whether two carriers have a great deal of equipment or four have less, it could be the same total. Thank you. I'm, I'm uh, not in favor of this amendment just for those particular reasons, but thank you. Further discussion on, we have, yes, Ms. Sekos. Thanks, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Dimitra Tsekris, Precinct 4. A question, I guess, um, Bob. <laughs> I understand that there's a way of testing for EMF, this electromagnetic force or whatever. Has the town of Reading ever done that in the home surrounding the area of the cell towers? Mr. Lillisher. Help. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, you know, if we had folks here from the health department, they might know. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any information, yes or no. Okay, so you're not aware if it's ever been done? Or not done, I just don't know. Okay, is it something that the town could look into to assure those residents that they're not, that their homes aren't polluted? People might think this is like cuckoo, but this is a real thing, and if I lived near there, I would share Ms. Whiting's concern. Mr. Lewis. Um, the town would have no problem in looking into it. I think from, I, I have a good friend that lives in Connecticut that lives near power lines, and um, the results of a study are in the eye of the beholder quite often. Um, it's not black and white science as I understand it. Now, whether this would be similar to the issue I'm familiar with, I don't know. So the town would certainly be willing to do some work, but I'm not sure that it's going to give a black and white answer. For, for what it's worth, and I hear that, it happens that I'm involved at another school where this similar concern came up, and there was a study done. I'm happy offline to pass on, okay. you know, the consultant that we used to bring everyone's mind at rest. And it was pretty solid science, I guess. I don't know. Thank you. Further discussion on the, yes, over here. John Weaver, Precinct 6. I'm actually an attorney that works extensively in the wireless industry, um, so to address a, a couple of the questions that have popped up, um, the previous speaker is absolutely correct that this is pretty, within the industry, pretty solid science, easy to calculate, and there are a number of, of experts that can do studies relatively um, cost-effectively if the town is interested in that. There are also FCC standards that carriers are required to comply with. Um, and that um, establishes what is safe within certain distances and emissions levels. Uh, with regard to the question of property value, an issue that we're running into more and more is that the, the impact is not negatively when there is when there are antennas present, it's negative when there aren't antennas present because so many people are using only their cell phone. I think within certain demographics, the vast majority of people have a cell phone, they don't have a landline. And so if there isn't wireless coverage at the homes where they're looking to buy or rent, they consider that a, a negative externality that impacts the, the price of the, the home or the lease. Thank you. Further discussion on the uh, amendment that hasn't spoken yet? No? Okay. Oh, well, I'm I'll get to you, then I'll come back to you. Uh, Ms. Landry first, then I'll come back to you. Hi. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I was just wondering if we could put up the language of the amendment so we know what it is we're voting on. I don't know. 
I will read it again anyway. Uh, the, add the following. The replacement tank is to be designed and constructed to fit up to three cell carriers. Okay, Ms. Sekras. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dimitri Tsekras, Precinct 4. As a follow-up to the speaker before Ms. Landry. Um, well, now I just forgot my question. That happens, you know. I'll be back. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Jane Fiore, Precinct 3. Um, I was the health director before the initial uh, cell tower company put the uh, antenna on the um, water tank. We had probably 10 public hearings. Every house in the vicinity, the um, electromagnetic frequencies were taken in each house in the vicinity, going out a quarter of a mile. And then after the antenna was installed, it, they were repeated. Um, the study was done by um, the Department of Public Health with their radioactive frequency department, which is only a, a, num a matter of three individuals. Then, now I understand there are 12 people employed in that department. So it is a study that is frequently asked for by communities. The Department of Public Health does those studies um, as independently as a health department can even though it is a state agency, but there is no charge to the community upon request. I, since I've been retired for nine years, I don't think the study has been um, redone, but there obviously is still a file with that study in it. Um, we had multiple, multiple uh, hearings on it and graphs and designs, and it, even at that point 15 years ago, it was a solid scientific study. Um, I probably even have it on my laptop at home because it was constant questions and concern um, about how the um, electromagnetic field dissipated out lengthwise. So it moves out that way rather than down straight. Um, I probably know more about uh, electromagnetic fields than I would ever choose to know in my life, but I hope that might help Demetra. If not, the best I can do. <laughs> Further discussion, Mr. Simmons? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Harry Simmons, Precinct 4. Who's our expert in writing this contract? Mr. Lollisher? Uh, in terms of writing the RFP? Yes. Um, town Council would assist our procurement officer. Not this Town Council, but a different one. Uh, is there a structural expert involved? I'm sorry, say that again? A structural in expert? No. You mean we're just going to write? Well, we have our engineer, our town engineers here, oh. and our DPW director. Certainly they'll look it over, so yeah, I see, I see what you mean. Is there any warranties going to be involved with this? Huh? Well, we, all right, I'll let you finish this, but we are really still discussing the amendment. But uh, I'll just let you answer. Uh, Ryan Percival, town engineer. Uh, to answer your question, there are structural engineers that are involved with the design of the tank, um, so they would subsequently review um, anything that would go on the tank. Um, and the tank would be designed in such a fashion to hold the most extreme load that it could, if that answers your question. Uh, uh, there'd be protections and oversight of liabilities and defects and things that could happen? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Again, a reminder, we are speaking of strictly the amendment right now. Yes, Mr. Oh, yeah. Good evening. Uh, Dave Talbot, Precinct 5. I know a little bit about the topic, enough to say that um, on the amendment, it's not really a, it, it, we shouldn't vote for it. It's, it, they can co-locate anyway, even if you try to exclude I'm just speaking the microphone, it's hard to hear you. The carriers can share space and co-locate. So effectively they can achieve what they want to, even if you try to do this. And I don't think it would pass legal muster to do this amendment. To the larger point, uh, one thing localities can do is, is regulate aesthetics of the small cell and wireless equipment. 
so if, if the town doesn't have that in place, it's something you can do, and that will achieve some of the goals that people are seeking. On the health effects, um, as another speaker pointed out, there's FCC rules that come in, and um, localities cannot regulate um, beyond the health or the limits that are set by the FCC, much as you might want to. Uh, so I just thought I'd share that perspective. Thanks. Further discussion on the amendment? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. Now we move to the main motion, which requires a two-thirds vote. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, back to discussion on the main motion. Mr. Struhl? Thank you, Mr. Monitor, Jeff Struble, Precinct 7. Uh, just some nuts and bolts questions about this. You said it's going to be located in the same location as the current water tank. Um, does that mean it's going to, the, the old water tank is going to have to come down first before this goes up? Absolutely, yes. Even though we used to have two there. There used to be a rocket, if you remember, uh, right next door, right next to it. And it looks like I, I can't really make sense out of the little... little Mm -hmm. uh, plan you had because it's just I can't read it. Um, it looks like there was some space there that you could have erected the new one while the old one was in service. Is that a possibility? Mr. Lillis here. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, as I understand it, no, it's not possible. You need a certain amount of swing space for construction, and there was just no way to do that. Okay. And there's no need for it because we're fortunate to have burial. a second water tank. Okay. Gotcha. Um, second question. I'm assuming uh, that the cost of the demolition of the existing tank is included in this. That's correct. Okay. Third question, and this is for Precinct 7. I looked up what these things look like um, online. Is, first of all, is this going to be a, a designed tank or is this going to be a catalog order? Because um, they do, this is a fairly standard uh, piece of equipment out in the Midwest. Um, is there any, ind any indication that we can have any, any say on how it looks? Mr. Lelsher. You're going to laugh, but I wanted to have an outside layer of fish and have it be a tourist attraction and have a restaurant on top. Um, I, w I was told that ordering out of a catalog is the cheapest way, so that is what we will do. There is one color available. It's some okay. sort of blue. I forget it has a name. Well, so it, there is no flexibility on that. Quite a few of us see this as we're working at our kitchen window um, in the neighborhood, so that's why I was asking the question, because we would like to have some say in how it looks, but if we can't, so be it. Mr. Robinson. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chuck Robinson, Precinct 4. Uh, Bob, what uh, does the MWRA have any type of uh, capital help for their member communities? And have we looked into that? Mr. Lillisher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, we have had extensive discussions with the executive director on acquiring our second tank once this work is done so that we don't have to do it again on the second tank because really at this point with MWA supply, one tank is sufficient from every perspective. So no, they won't directly help us with this project, but hopefully they'll greatly help us indirectly by removing the obligation of the second tank from our hands. Further discussion? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Nick Boyvin, Precinct 7. Um, a few questions. Uh, the first maybe is one for the moderator's procedural question. Are we just voting on Article 17 as it's written in the handout, which the only two verbs here that I see are replacing and borrowing. Replace and we borrow. Or are we actually voting on what's in the packet that is significantly more detailed under background on pages 18 you, and 19. You're, make, you're voting on the motion, not the article. Right, so yes. the only thing we're voting to do is replace and borrow. Correct. If I read the text or for the town manager, is that fair? That's correct. Uh, borrowing. <laughs> right, so that's hence the two-thirds vote, right? So I just, the, so the first, uh, on the replacing question, let me, I have a question about replacing and a question about borrowing. Uh, but even with our vote tonight, this, the, the, if we vote for this, we're only replacing and, and we're borrowing. We're not saying anything about whether um, the particular technology or even the site is where this would have to be replaced, correct? Like the, the town would be free to... 
Uh, Mr. Would you mind rephrasing that? I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry. I let, me, let me try to be more clear. So, the the vote tonight doesn't direct the town. It's not instructional. It doesn't direct the town to replace at the current site, as shown in the in pages eight, 18 and 19, or to use the particular CET composite technology that's in the background section. Is that right, or is or is this? Uh, that's an interesting point. No, it doesn't. It just says replace. But I'm telling you what we would do. Um, so, you, could, you could certainly put that in the motion if you'd feel. So yeah, we could, we could amend it, and yeah. I'm not going to make this amendment because I don't feel that strongly about it, but if, if others in this body do, it's possible at this time to amend this motion to say, as, in, as written in the background section on pages 18 and 19 of this book, but just make sure you know what you're voting on. You're only voting to replace and borrow. All right, so if everyone's cool with that. I'm, I'm good with that, but just want to make sure everyone's on the same page, literally. Um, second question is on the borrowing. I started to add up, it's just the dollars are starting to add up right now. Maybe it's a finance committee question for um, the, the finance committee. But um, so we voted on Article 15 to replace Turf 2, 2.25, 2.25 million. We voted 4 million for security. This is 4.5 million for a water tank. And I think there's a $1 million borrowing in Article 18. There may be more if I didn't count that up. So that's about 11.725 million in borrowing that we're authorizing if we, if we vote all of these. And I just would be interested from the Finance Committee perspective, which I know we haven't talked about that last article yet, but you know, I think our free cash reserve is above 7%. What was the thinking behind moving to authorize borrowing for all these motions instead of using free cash for them? Mr. Willis here. Um, certainly Eric can speak to that. I just want to make sure that it's understood that two of these would come only from the water fund. The four and a half and the one million are only water fund, not general fund. The rest is from the general fund where free cash matters. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Moderator. Um, we, we did have that discussion, not necessarily in relation to this article, uh, but with uh, respect to, I think it was um, Turf 2, um, and wh whether we should fund that one out of free cash. But the perspective we took was we have a policy, as you said, for the minimum uh, cash reserves, but we also have a policy regarding capital expenditures at 5%. And there's room, that, that's what that policy is for. There's room within the plan to accommodate it. Let's let that capital plan do its job and let it live there. Thank you for making that distinction. And I'm glad you brought up Turf 2, which brings me to my last point. I think we hope to get more life out of Turf 2 than we did um, from the original technology. Granted, that was Turf, and this is water tanks. Um, but my last question for the town manager is just that if we, if we were as a body to specify that this specific type of technology that you have in the book, which as it currently stands, you don't have to use. But if you do go ahead and use uh, composite elevated tank technology, is that the right technology? Is it suitable for Massachusetts climate? And are we going to get, you know, hopefully the desired life lifespan out of the product? Have you talked to other municipalities that have done these very infrequent types of upgrades to their water systems? And what have you learned? Thank you. Mr. Wallacher. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'll certainly invite the uh, DPW to stand up and supplement my answer. but. One of the challenges when you're buying relatively new technology that's advertised with a long life is there's no proof. Um, you know, that was true maybe 20 years ago with turf fields. This is a relatively new technology that, as I understand it, meaning within the last, you know, 20, 25 years. Um, on the one hand, they don't make it like they used to, but this is such a superior product that does not require maintenance or painting that it's not so much will it last 40, 50, or 60 years, it's during those 40 years, it's, it's not quite free, but it's almost maintenance free compared to spending millions of dollars to do work on the other material. So if you will, as long as you get 30, 40 years out of it, you're in the clear from that perspective. Will you get 60, will you get 80? There's no way to know that. Yes, Ms. Herrick. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Karen Herrick, Precinct 8. I just want to take a moment. I was really excited in our Finance Committee meeting when this Warren article came up because let, let's, let's thank the, the leadership in the town and all of our participation because we actually have money in the bank to pay for this kind of capital improvements. Um, water pipes wear out over time, and, and the previous speaker is correct. We've needed to spend a lot more money, but guess what? We've saved for this in the sewer funds, and we have the money to pay for it, so we all deserve a pat on the back. Further discussion? Yes, we're on the edge. Stephen Cole, Precinct 6. I'd like to ask the uh, engineer, um, 
has this water tower been uh, uh, used in many northern U.S., southern Canadian uh, areas where they have this kind of weather, maybe around the Great Lakes, where you've got a lot of variability, you've got a lot of cold, you've got snow, precipitation. This, this particular style tank, you don't even have to look that far. Um, there's actually one that was just constructed in Peabody, Massachusetts. Um, it's up on top of a very big outcrop of ledge. You probably can see it from the highway. Um, it has been used out in the Midwest. Uh, again, it's not painted material. It's a glass-fused product onto steel, so it doesn't require a painting. Um, and they have not been installed for more than 20 or 30 years right now. So when they say 40 or 50 year life expectancy, that's because we haven't seen any that have lasted for 100 years. Um, I will tell you we have one that's there from 1953 right now. Um, it's not in the best of shape, but it's certainly not falling down. Um, it does have some structural um, deficiencies, and that's why we do need to replace it. Um, but again, if you'd, if you'd like, you probably could see the one in Peabody. It's, very, it's a lot smaller than what we need. We need a 750,000 gallon, which is similar to what we have now, or exactly what we have now. So again, to answer your question, there's one in Peabody. Well, my uh, concern would be the change in materials. Uh, if it's using the same materials as uh, were used in the 1953 water tower, would not be as much of a concern to me, just a, a different uh, construction using the same materials, but using different materials, a glass coating on, on, a, uh, on a metallic surface, let's say. Are we going to see delamination? Are we going to see fragmentation? Um, cracking of the, uh, of the surface and allowing uh, uh, oxidation of the underlying metal. Uh, this is the sort of thing that you only really can see over time. Even, even accelerated laboratory testing won't tell you. You really only know after some period of time. And do we want to be the, the uh, pioneers in this? I wouldn't necessarily say we're the pioneers. I would say that this is the proven material that um, any, any tank that would be put, put up today would be a glass fused to steel tank um, on top of a concrete pedestal. So you take the whole pedestal out of the situation where you have to even replace that, um, that would be concrete. The wear and tear in concrete is, I mean, the life expectancy is a long time. On top of that is a steel tank, which is exactly similar to what we have now, which is a steel tank. And keep in mind, back, even back in 1953, we were painting these tanks with lead paint. So um, we have come leaps and bounds and know what type of materials that are, that are appropriate for our water quality. Um, this is an appropriate uh, material. I'm not concerned about reinforced concrete. I think that's a well-proven technology. My concern is in the uh, uh, construction of the uh, walls of the tank, which it sounds, as you said, like uh, a glass-coated uh, steel substrate. Am I correct? Uh, the, the coating is it, it's just a different type of coating. You would paint the inside of the tank. If we were to repaint the tank that's currently there now, which we cannot do because we have some structural deficiencies, um, you would paint it. That paint over time would crack, it would slough off, um, it would cause rust spots on the inside mm -hmm. and uh, outside of the tank. The glass fused to steel, it, it's fused to steel. We don't have that cracking or expansion contraction that we have with paint where we're sloughing off. That's why there's little to no maintenance on that paint. Um, again, this is, this, if you were to put, put up a new tank right now, this is what you would install. This is the best product that's out there now. Um, it requires zero to no maintenance in the next 30 years that we know of, if not longer. We just haven't seen these tanks as long as 50 years. Have any been used in the northern US, southern Canada, like I asked before? Uh, I know there is, I know just in one in particular, of one manufacturer of these tanks. I believe they're based out of the New York area. Um, so yes, in, in this region. 
Um, there's some around the Great Lakes. Um, I'd have to actually bring up the website to actually pinpoint exactly where they are. Um, but again, there's one in Peabody. They've been used around in Rhode Island and various other states in New England. Um, so this is not something that's um, not for our climate. Have you or one of your colleagues uh, spoken with, uh, uh, with uh, your peers in some of these other areas, these other towns, counties that have put this uh, type of tank in? Uh, the town has hired a consultant that this is specifically what they do. They um, design water facilities, not just distribution systems, but also storage facilities. And they've installed several of these. I, I believe one was in Hopkinton, too. If I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's where it was. Um, Sam consultant, and they're the pioneers. They're the experts in the field, and that's... Um, so you haven't... Uh investigate it on yourself to see what the uh, customers' opinions are over the years. Um, can you repeat that again? I'm sorry, I missed that. So is it correct that you have not consulted with other customers of this tank, no, this type of technology? Absolutely not. That's not correct. Uh, oh, we okay. actually went on a field trip to go visit the PBD site, which is a, it's a private facility, we were able to gain access to it and actually climb the tank, inspect the tank. Um, so we, you know, physically... What, sorry, what site was that? The PBD site? Oh, PBD, okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Further discussion? Yes, on the edge. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Greg Sabatelli, Precinct 6. A um, few questions. Uh, on terms of warranty, what's the typical warranty period on these new tanks? Is it 5, 10, 15, 20? What, what do they typically give? We haven't gotten into the actual warranty piece of the, the specifications, but there are warranties for these. Um, you know, without you know, going through specifics, I, I don't want to really give you an, an answer on that. I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be highly unlikely to see a tank with a warranty of, of 10 years, if not more, but I, I, I don't have that answer. And in terms of replacement, um, is it in the same vicinity of height and, and width, you know, that you see in their current tank, you know, for the, the residents of the, that Precinct 7 area? Is it going to be bigger, smaller? Um, it will look different in the sense that it won't have spindles on the side, it'll have a central, central column. The bowl itself, this actual storage bowl, it's an elevated tank, that will be a 750,000 gallon tank, roughly the same diameter. The height actually is a fixed point. We really can't go too much higher in the tank itself because of pressure issues. Um, so the tank height is going to be roughly around the same height, about 110 plus or minus. Okay. And in terms of the other water tower that we have, you know, what's the time frame when we might need to replace that one? Is that four years out, two years out, ten uh, years out? So we've been planning for this. Um, we've been planning for this for quite some time. Um, the massive project that went down Oak Street was part of this. Um, the MWA loop through is the Northern Intermediate High. And because of the, them looping through and um, closing that loop up through Stoneham, which was a redundancy issue, we gained two um, feed points out of that as opposed to the one that we currently have now. With the two feed points plus larger piping coming off of the 36-inch pipeline that came through town, we have more than enough capacity to supply the town just based on those two feeds. Uh, storage is not only for high demand, but it's also for fire flow capabilities. We have enough with the 750,000 gallon tank on Auburn Street to just take care of those needs. We would not need Bear Hill tank. Uh, we will utilize Bear Hill when we demolish this tank and put it back in place. Okay. And then one other question, in terms of the funding, I know this is for replacement and for borrowing for that. Does this funding, um, and, we t and you mentioned, um, or not you, but Mr. Um, but our town manager mentioned that um, security of the, of the water tower in terms of having the cell towers on that unit, you know, that's obviously not the best, you know, security protocol. But and I know we talked about this in a prior town meeting about having a separate structure for, for the cell towers. Is this funding, does any of it cover security in terms of the grounds, the fencing, or, or is it just purely water tower funding, that's it? Mr. Lowe, sure. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Monarch. I would say that the funding covers a certain amount of ground work, um, whether it's cosmetic, whether it's security. Um, if the community desires significant um, improvements on the ground, this, this would not cover it. But this will make it look more attractive, at least, than it, than it is now. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Ms. Sequis? Thanks, Mr. Moderator. Demetrius Sekris, Precinct 4. A couple of questions. Is the concrete hollow and will it be used for storage, as some of these can be? And if you already said this and I missed it, I apologize. Uh, no, I didn't actually mention this, but yes, it will be hollow. Um, we have a standpipe that goes on the in, inside edge, but it allows for a lot of storage capacity. There's a garage door where you can actually fit a whole truck inside. So will there be a lot of coming and going, or is it like, is there already storage at this water tank that will just be duplicated, or is this something new? There currently isn't any storage under this water tank. It's open air underneath, so, yeah, I mean, you can go up to Auburn Street and see for yourself now, but um, we would have minor equipment, grounds equipment. Um, that's the intent of the storage. There's also sampling points that we have internal that we'll be doing internally on okay. the uh, water system that we were doing out of that column area. Okay. And can you paint it? I understand you don't have to, but could the concrete pedestal be painted? It's generally not Beautifully. painted. Beautifully. Okay. It's generally not painted. Um, I, suppose, I suppose it could be looked into. Like if an artist wanted to do an enormous mural, that could happen. <laughs> Mr. Lelishur has an answer. Mr. Lelishur, do you have any nuns with buckets of paint you have in mind? <laughs> I can arrange it. <laughs> um, I had one final question, and I think the answer isn't going to make me happy, but I'm going to ask it of the engineer. Is it possible, I understand because of the height, this is pretty exposed to the sun, is it possible to hang solar panels or put solar panels on these things? Is that a thing? No. Uh, no. <laughs> no. 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 Uh, I know. We generally do not, we want to we want to keep things like that off the tank because anytime you have a connection point It gets on the wobbly. Tank, well, not, not just wobbly as we have, if you have a connect, anytime you have a connection point, you, you jeopardize that glass coating. Yeah, it gets wobbly. That's the technical term. Thank you. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? This requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor of the motion, please rise. Thirty-three. Thirty-three. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. Thirty-five. Thirty-five. Forty-two. 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 Okay, those opposed? Zero. 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 One. One. Zero. Zero. The vote being 138 in the affirmative and one in the negative, the motion carries. Business under Article 8, Mr. Wellisher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, this is also a uh, debt authorization, again, from the Water Enterprise uh, Fund. And this is uh, to make some improvements, water main improvements in the Grove Street area. Um, I have a map uh, behind me that shows the general location. And if you go from the compost center entrance down to roughly Meadowbrook, that section of the water main is scheduled to be cleaned. If you then go from approximately, approximately Meadowbrook out to Grove Street, that uh, water main is scheduled to be replaced and enlarged. When we changed to the MWRA, again, perhaps I should back up for those not familiar with it, um, this is the location of our former water treatment plant, um, just, just down um, off this area. When we changed the full MWRA in 2006, that changed the dynamics and the flow of water in the town. A 2012 study um, suggested some long-term changes we should make. 
Um, they, were, they were not imminently needed at the time, and we waited for the uh, North Reading decision because that would impact what the flow through Reading of water was. When they finally decided a year or two ago not to pursue the MWRA, um, then we were clear to make our own decision for our own needs. Um, as it turned out in the Grove Street area, now we really do need to make this change. We have seen decreased flow rates in the area. The quality of the water is still good. And again, this project would, uh, would clean and cement line 1,500 feet uh, near Meadowbrook uh, Golf Course and then replace, replace almost 1,000 feet of 6-inch with new 8-inch cement pipe. Income report, Mr. Doerr. At our March 13th meeting, the Finance Committee voted 7-0 to recommend this article to town meeting. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? This requires a two-thirds vote. I will take a, a, uh, a hand count first. If that uh, is unanimous, we will accept it. Otherwise, we'll take a standing count. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Business under Article 19. Mr. Lillisher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, this is an annual article. Uh, the state uh, funds something called Chapter 90 for roadway improvements. Uh, Reading had, for many years, has gotten in the neighborhood of 600,000. One year we were lucky and we had 900,000. Um, what the motion will be is to uh, accept whatever amount the state gives us and be grateful about it. Um, <laughs> the danger is if you put in a number and they change their mind at the last minute, town meeting may have not authorized the exact right amount. There's every indication that you see the numbers just under 600,000 behind us. Um, I'm on the one hand, proud to say the town also supplements this with about 600,000 of general fund money to do work on the roads. Um, the unfortunate part is for those in town meeting 10 or so years ago, that's not enough to keep up the road conditions. We're a cut through community. That's one of the pleasures of uh, being near the highways is we don't have tolls up so other people don't pay for this, we do. Uh, the state chapter 90 funding formula does account for that to some degree, um, but we do need more than the million two we're spending to really keep up with the quality of the roads, unfortunately. Income report, Mr. Brent. At our meeting on March 13th, the Finance Committee voted 7 0 to recommend this article to town meeting. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? It's just like the last one, it requires a two thirds vote, but we'll try a hand count first. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Business under Article 24, Mr. Struble. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Jeff Struble, Chair of the Bylaw Committee. Um, Article 24 came about as the result of an instructional motion that was made in uh, the subsequent town meeting uh, held 11, uh, November 16, 2017. Uh, an instructional motion put forward by uh, Demetra Sakaris, Precinct 4. Uh, it carried by a vote of 66 to 52. Um, try and bring it up if I can. Uh, the instructional motion reads, as you can see, um, and it was directing the bylaw uh, in, in conjunction with the Board of Selectmen to remove gendered language from the general bylaw and the charter uh, and provide progress, in, as you can read it. Um, 
in the last sentence there, the, by the April 2018 town meeting, have a motion changing board of selectmen to select board or recommend a gender neutral title. You'll recall we had that discussion some uh, town meetings ago when we did change the uh, title of the board of selectmen to the select board. Those changes have been made in the bylaw already, so that's not going to be part of this presentation. Uh, the other thing to say about this is that uh, we mentioned this before. Uh, the bylaw committee has no jurisdiction over the charter. Uh, that has to be done by the charter review committee, which is um, uh, established every, at least every 10 years. And I think the last one was 2015, but I'm not quite sure. I was on it. But um, um, the next one probably be uh, 2025, and probably will start getting going on 2023. So that will, I think, be brought up when that, that uh, committee is, is uh, populated and they start doing their deliberations, but the bylaw committee can't do anything about it. So we're just talking about the general bylaws tonight. And um, before I start, um, I'd like to make a friendly, friendly amendment, if I may. Oh, also before I start, uh, I don't think I'm going to go over 10 minutes, but I may have to ask uh, permission to do so if that happens. So I haven't rehearsed this. I didn't time it with a stopwatch, but it might happen. Mr. Struble. Pardon? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, there are two friendly amendments I'd like to make, mainly because of typos. Um, if you look in, uh, under Article 2, uh, here it says uh, Section 2.21, there is no 2.21, it's 2.2.1. So I'm going to put that in there if nobody objects. Is there any objection to that change? Okay. Not appearing, we'll assume it's part of the main motion. Okay. Uh, the other one is on page 23 of your handout, which is um, Article 7D. There is a word missing. Uh, if you notice here, um, it says, no person shall refuse entry to any building owned by him after receipt of written what? It's written receipt. It was just, it was just left out. So I'm just going to put that in if no one objects. Where are you? OK. Is there any objection? Not appearing? OK. Just keep that in mind. All right. Um, how did we do this? Um, the bylaw committee met several times uh, uh, between uh, November of 2017 and t today. Um, what we did was we took the eight articles that are in the, the uh, general bylaws and divided them into four sets of two each. And we only had four members at the time, so two. Uh, all, we each took a set of two and uh, reviewed them for changing the gender language, brought them back to the public meetings, exchanged the ideas, made the corrections, and then swapped um, and did it again. And essentially, you're, as you can see, we're getting down to less and less changes, but more like checking each other's work by the time we were done. Uh, when we finally got all done, uh, we voted on whether or not we should uh, send it to town council, and we did. And uh, town council reviewed it and came back. And uh, I think twice we had to, we had uh, edits of, the, of it from them to uh, uh, to be made, and they're all in, in, in included in the the packet that you see here. So um, what I'm going to do is rather than I know you um, there were requests, I guess, for the redlined um, version of the bylaws, which uh, the town clerk sent out to those whose email addresses she had. Um, that's great. We're going to bring that up, too. Uh, we'll be able to zero in on that. But the changes were such that they were very repetitive. Uh, a lot of it were, you know, changing, you know, for the main, I'll get to the main ones, changing chairman, chair, things like that. Um, so it was about with, I thought we'd rather, the, all the changes are summarized here in your, in your article. And I'll go through and give you some categories of how those were done. But rather than, than slogging here and going line by line, uh, we thought I'd just give you the examples of the categories. And then once that's done, uh, if you want to zero in on some of them, we can do that. And we'll do that. I'll bring it up. Oh. 
Yes. Are you sure? Yeah. I'm standing corrected. The, re the friendly amendment has been amended again. Um, it's not received as request. Okay, there. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, I'm getting back to the changes. Which one was? I get position positioned here so we can start off. You think the first thing you should do is just change all the, the male pronouns to something else. Um, for example, going from um, uh, he and his to they and theirs. And the first inclination we had was to essentially make everything plural. Uh, but the trouble with that is you start having to change all the verbs as well. So we, we did change uh, a couple of, of the bylaws just by virtue of that. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Eight. You notice here, notice here in Rule 8, uh, we changed uh, himself to themselves and himself to themselves. That was pretty straightforward. That's not as much as uh, you would think have been carried through. We found a lot of times that the, um, the most common thing to do is replace the gender-specific pronoun with essentially a description of the individual being referred to, such as that person for him and or, or that party or that applicant. Um, and I'll give you an example just quick of what that means. Yeah, here's one where uh, changing he to the town clerk, good reason. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's, 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 that's something that is, is carried through in many places. Uh, if you want some more, I can show you, but uh, I didn't want to take up too much time just doing that. Um, by far, um, the most numerous changes, and I think you've seen in, in all your, in your, your packets, are, for example, the pages uh, 24 and uh, 25, uh, almost the top half, two-thirds two are changing chairman to chair, and that just happened a lot. So that's what, uh, that was a, a great deal of... Uh, the changes that you see in your packet are for that reason and that reason alone. Um, there's a very interesting one which came up, I think, uh, town council found, uh, which is changing uh, such things as a man-made and man-whole. You wouldn't, you probably walk, wouldn't even, you'd probably read, read right over that and not think it was gender specific, but in fact it is. Uh, so, um, that was one of the edits that came back from town council, and that is shown, if you want to zero in on it. Okay. 8.5.7. Here we go. 
Um, it was, uh, you know, disturb in any manner, any barrier sign, manhole cover. Well, we changed manhole to utility access cover. Now, wh why do that? Um, it, it says what it is. That's, 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 most of this, these changes are essentially describing what, really, what you really want to mean uh, and not use anything, any kind of gender nuanced language to do it. And, you know, a manhole cover certainly is a utility access cover. Um, another one, if you look in there, is changing man made to artificial. Perfect. I mean, it, it, it says exactly the same thing. Uh, but, you know, it does get rid of the, you know, the gender nuanced. Uh, language of man, uh, man-made. So, um, the last one that was sort I think I, I mentioned this in my report of progress, is that we like to um, essentially not rewrite per se, because none of these, that, that's something you, you have to re realize, none of these were done uh, that changed any kind of context of the, uh, of the bylaw. It was really just changing the uh, getting rid of the, the gender specific language and not changing the, the, the intent or the meaning of the bylaw at all. Very much uh, uh, watched over by town council to make sure that happened. So uh, this is really just, it's almost like we say, it's, it's almost like house, uh, uh, housekeeping. It, it was that, that simple, I guess, and that it, it, nothing, there wasn't much uh, thought involved in, in changing the bylaw because we couldn't. That was not our charge and that would, It'd be a whole other uh, can of worms if we tried to do that. Um, let's see. This one I love. Um, 8.9.9.4. That's to do with the chief of police. Um, the original language that was the chief of police shall cause to be kept in his office. Why it has to be cause to be kept, I don't know. That happens a, a couple of times. But the, the most simpler thing was to say, shall be kept in the chief of police's office. That, why do you have to, put, you know, that's the easy, simple, easy way to get rid of the, uh, the, uh, the, the his pronoun. And it says exactly what, it, what it's meant and in very simple language. Those are the ones we love to find. And uh, you'll find them through here. I, I do some other examples, but you know, I, I think that one more or less points out the the uh, the result of it. So, um, oh yeah, I just was saying we di we didn't change any context. Um, I'm going to take a gamble and say that's it. Uh, I know you've got uh, there was quite a few uh, items to go through. But I can assure you that uh, they were all uh, vetted by both the bylaw committee and town council to, uh, to make sure that none of the bylaw co context or meaning were, were changed. So at that point, I'm just going to open up to questions. And do you have a, a report of the bylaw? I surely do. On the, at our meeting of uh, January 30th, the bylaw committee voted to support the uh, content of this article to town meeting by a vote of 4 to 0. Is there further discussion? Uh, yes, up in the back. Jeffrey Corum, Precinct 7. I just want to thank the Bylaw Committee for the, the tedious work of going through all of the, the details to get this sorted out. I appreciate that, and I'm glad you said that, because it's, I, want, I wanted to introduce the members of the Bylaw Committee. Um, well, the members of the Bylaw Committee are myself. Um, our Vice Chair is uh, Chris O'Donohue. Our secretary is uh, Jana Stafford. Uh, our resident old man is Steve Crook. <laughs> um, and our, uh, our brand new member is uh, Jason Clark. Jason, you here? Oh, uh, we now have a five member board. We're, we're full strength, and that's wonderful. Mr. Wells? <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator Carwell, Precinct 7. I remembered it right this time. Um, do we have any idea how much this costs since we're all very concerned about micromanaging every nickel that the town spends? Uh, I didn't charge you a dime. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, as, as, as far, what do you mean by cost? It's, it, it is, it will be a Staff time, council time, how much did this cost to do? Mr. Um, the staff time was free. Where's Matt? Oh, he's, there he is. So Matt was free. I don't know how much town council time. I could find that out. They do itemize their bill and report it to the select board, but I don't know the number off the top of my head. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Sekras. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dimitri Sekras, Precinct 4. Thank you very much. I'll uh, also say for the tedious work. But, you know, I, I, I was struck by um, how much there was and how elegant you, you did the job. The bylaws look great. And I'd like to move the question. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot accept that from somebody who said, who has spoken. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Uh, Boyvin. I, I too want to thank the collective effort for going through this. this. is a lot of very detailed work. I just had three specific questions, and maybe we could just look at three sections. I just want to make sure that the changes uh, are not changing any meaning unintentionally in, in three specific sections. One is uh, 4B, which is section 5413. Very specific targeted questions. Section 5.4.1.3. The original language said his criminal history, and the new record said the new language says that record. So it's a bit of an eye test for everybody involved here, I realize. Well, um, so the original, you see it says a copy of the criminal history record. I just want to make sure that the, that that is replacing criminal history still okay, refers to criminal history. Right, I understand your question. The, the, original, the original one uh, read, upon receipt of, a re receipt of a report from the FBI or other appropriate criminal justice agency, a record subject may request and receive a copy of that record because it's referencing the, the, the record that came from the FBI. That's, that's that doesn't necessarily have to be, that is not necessarily like, why did you have to change criminal history there to make it gender neutral? Because it was, it was, uh, it was already, it was, it was referred to up above as appropriate criminal justice. Well, a report from the, yeah, another appropriate, a record, a record subject and request to a copy of, hmm. As opposed to I, 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 criminal what, history Where's record. the subject is what you're asking. I understand the deleting his. I'm fine with that. It's just, I just want to make sure. So if it's a record that's not a criminal history, are we changing the meaning of that? That's my one question on that. His criminal history as opposed to that criminal history record. You mean put the that in front of criminal history and keep it? Do you have another question while they're looking at that? I can, but it's going to involve moving to another okay. section, so I don't mind waiting. I, if, I don't think I'll hit 10 minutes on this. At least I hope I won't. I'll sit down if I do. How's that? And, and I would raise the question, this, I guess criminal history is a very specific legal term, and, and a record from a from a part of the government I, that I understand. I guess is the, law enforcement doesn't have to be a criminal history Because record. what this will do is not, is negate it, the classification as a criminal history. It's just a record. It Correct. seems to broaden it in my reading. Should it be that broad? So now they can require, request any record, not just the criminal history record. Is that the intent? Okay, the, the subject is the criminal, is the, the record that came from the FBI, be it criminal or not. So um, that's why it's called that record. It's referring to that, the record that comes from uh, the FBI or other appropriate criminal justice agency. So it's not necessarily a criminal history. It is a record that came from those agencies. 
In my reading, it's broadening the language so you can request more records than you could otherwise have requested before. Before it was just a criminal history, now it's any record that comes from the FBI. I, I'm not, I don't object to it. I'm just okay. pointing out that it's, I'll still vote for it. I'm just pointing out that it's a very different provision than what existed before this amendment. That's true. Uh, as long as town council is okay with it, I just sub substantively it is a different. You are giving someone the power to request more records than they could have requested before this amendment was made. Before they could only get their criminal history. Now they can get anything. Well, as long as it comes from that source. You want to keep? I mean, to keep the the intent. What if we just said that criminal history? That would be fine with me. You want to make that amendment? I will, I will make a series of proposed amendments we can put. You want to vote on these individually? It might be yes, to unless, do that if, unless so they're all I'll make that amendment thing. to change um, that to that criminal history. Okay, is there a second to that motion? Okay, is there any other? Before, well, I, you know, I'll come back to you, but is there any further discussion on that proposed amendment? Um, okay, hang on. Mr. Struble, did you have? I understand. I have to get to the right place. Okay. Yep. In the right, in the right document. Yeah. Uh, it is 4B, page 24 of the packet. Gotcha. After said criminal history record, right where your cursor is drifting. Place the. Uh, said cr said I think it's got to be the inserted language. I'm criminal sorry. history right here. Inserting in place thereof. No, there. no, lower down. No. Down one line, the text, quote, then you start, that criminal history record. Right here. Yeah. Yes. That's the amendment. Thank you. Okay. okay. Is there, I'll come back to you, Mr. Boydman. Is there discussion on that particular amendment? Yes, Mr. Grant? If I could just make, oh, sorry, Tom Grant, Precinct 4. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Just a friendly amendment. Maybe that subject's criminal history record, because in the original language, to change it to that criminal history record, at least the way I would read it would be that we had already talked about a specific criminal history record, but there actually is no specific language criminal history record in the bylaw before that. Um, So I think like what Mr. Boyman was saying was all these tests could be run and then the subject could request his criminal history record. But then if we say we receive a copy of that criminal history record, the criminal history record isn't defined above that. So we say a record subject may request and receive a copy of that subject's criminal history record, it's a, a little tighter to his, his replaced by that subject's. Mr. Levin, would you accept Does that the original the vendor? Okay, fine. Okay. Is there further discussion on that proposed amendment? Yes, I see a hand behind you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Demetri Sekras, Precinct 4. In fact, I think if you read back, um, a couple of sentences before the change. It says, the state and FBI criminal history will not be disseminated to unauthorized entities. Upon receipt of a report from the FBI or other appropriate criminal justice agency, a record subject may request and receive a copy of that record from the police department. I think it's referenced. So I don't see a reason for the amendment. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? And appearing. All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. Mr. Boyvin, did you have other comments? Uh, two more. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Nick Boyvin, Precinct 7. All right. uh, 7C, page 25, section 8.5.4. What's, I'm sorry, what's the section? 7. Uh, section 8.5.4, it's 7C in the packet, or in the motion. 7C here, and then in the bylaws, it's 8.5.4. Okay. Right here? Yeah, so the 
C is in Charlie. He has first. The Sorry. unless. What happened to that unless? Sorry? See, the, you're replacing it with language, and the unless disappears in the new language. Which line? I'm sorry. Yeah. So you, the, the language, right where your cursor is. Yep, you're right there. See the unless to the left of your dot? Okay, unless and you're... unless he is replaced by and. Unless he, unless he is replaced by what? Nothing. The unless just disappears. Oh. Is that okay? Does that, does that change? Does the absence of the unless change? Maybe we could just look at it in the amendment, amended version. So I understand the departure of he, but the unless. Mr. Mayor. Thanks. Mr. Mayor. Thanks. We made the first unless do du double duty by sticking in the and. Okay, so the unless is still contextually applicable to the new language, correct? The unless is, that was deleted in the first half of that phrase, is still present yeah. and applicable to yes, yes. the new language. Okay, gotcha. You right here? Get rid of it? No, I'm not amending it at all. I just, the town council, I think, answered my question. If his reading of, of the sentence there is that the unless would still apply to that phrase, that we're not okay. changing the meaning of the substance of that section by removing that unless, then I'm, I don't need to amend it. Or we could just look at the language in the, in the actual bylaws. That might be quicker. I might be pushing my 10 minutes here. Eight point five point four. Eight point five point four, you said? Unless he complies. Okay. okay, so it distributes the town council. I want to make sure the town council agrees that that first unless still distributes to both both applies to both that person as first obtained and complies with. Correct? You agree with that? Okay. That's the answer, yes. and complies as long as that's the opinion of town council, I can accept that. Uh, and last question. Okay. Uh, going back to the, the end of the article, uh, page 27. You as an umbrella. 7U. Which one, sir? U is in an umbrella. Oh, I'm sorry, you're in 8.10.7. I'm sorry, 8.10.7. Yeah. So the text that we're removing says, if the building inspector determines, and the new text says, upon determining. Upon determining. What, what was the view of why that was changed from an if to an upon? Why was that needed? Uh, because we didn't want to, again, didn't, didn't want to put too many words in there and, and uh, just have the building inspector referenced once. So that essentially is sort of a, if the building inspector determines action, uh, the building is unsafe. Uh, okay. Get, replace he with the building inspector, but then get rid of the building, the first building inspector, because it was, well, just trying to be elegant, I suppose. So there's no, so if, whether a building is unsafe or not is an open-ended determination upon determining is, only allows action in the event of that outcome. I just want to make sure that's not a change in substance of the article. Determines that the building is unsafe. This is very subtle. I mean, if you. But it's different. Yes. Mr. Miaris. So we start with the general rule that we're trying to replace pronoun he with a noun. So in this case, we wanted to replace the pronoun he with the building inspector. But then that, that results in the words the building inspector to appear twice in the sentence. Makes it awkward. So you that's the reason why we changed it from, repeat from if inspector. he determines to upon determining. Legally, there's no difference in the meaning. 
Okay. That's the opinion. Thank you. Further okay. discussion? Thank you. Mr. Sasso? That's what we do in the meetings anyway, so. Mr. Sasso? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, so um, I suspect I'm probably one of the people that I um, emailed to ask about getting a full context of the of the um, bylaw like this, um, just for the f information for the Board of Selectmen going forward. I know in the past, especially when we've had complicated bylaws, just having this up in front of us makes it a lot easier to review. And I know it came out today, so right, I did go through it, but. Um, getting this to all the town meeting members was a bit difficult because not everybody has email, and if we printed it out, it would be 111 pages, well, so. And, and I'm certainly okay with email. It's a different issue, but yes, I, I, again, Trying to do it with the way the warrant was versus this, it's night and day. Um, I did have, um, oh. um, so I'd, I had one actually interesting question. So um, section 1.11, which actually is the definition, not, it's in, I'm not sure if it's in definitions or it's right after definitions. That's one number and gender? Yes. Mm -hmm. I was just curious after having done this, why you didn't just delete and gender and the rest of that because you've fixed it, right? <laughs> um, I think probably belt and suspenders is the, is the answer to that. But will it, is that, in case we missed anything. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, we went through this bylaw dozens of times until we stopped finding anything else. But um, there isn't um, an algorithm that you can apply. So just in case there's something else um, that we missed, we don't think there is, but if there is, we'll leave that in for a while. If we get used to it, once we get used to always using gender neutral language and we don't find anything else and we want to get rid of that other provision, that's fine. Okay. Um, uh, just add my other comment. I do think you guys did a good job in areas where you were doing things like that to try to make it more contextual to a, to a title versus a gender. I think that was actually a really good way of approaching it. So thank you. Further discussion? None appearing. No, Mr. Oh, where? Oh, Mr. Tuttle. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. David Tuttle of Precinct 3. Um, the, there's two of the, of the minor changes which I think uh, could or should be eliminated. Um, your section 71F, I think it is, which is the term manhole, the manhole definition in the dictionary is gender neutral, point one. And the same uh, issue for item V, which is the term man-made. The definition of man-made is extremely gender neutral. So I think these are uh, unnecessary changes. Further discussion? Um, oh, Mr. Struble. The problem with leaving them in, at least think to the bylaw committee's way of thinking, was that it's inconsistent. And yes, it's the, you can look into you know, whatever dictionary you'd like to find and see if it's gender neutral, but I think anybody reading it, uh, not finding any reference to any gender and all of a sudden coming across manhole or man-made, it seems like a step backwards. And yeah, I mean, you're, you can probably, would, you know, I don't think there'd be any uh, problem with leaving it the way it is, except that when we're trying to get the gender-specific language out of the bylaw, that kind of sticks out. That was, that was the bylaw committee's thinking. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 25, Mr. Struble. Okay. Article 25 is um, essentially the items we found when we're going through the uh, gender neutral uh, examination that should be changed, but it had nothing to do with, with the gender. And so it had to have a separate, a separate article to be, uh, to be correct. So I'll explain where, where they came from. Uh, the first one, deleting section 5.4.4, effective date in its entirety. Let me bring it up.
Okay, uh, first some history of Section 5.4. Uh, back in April 30th of 2012, this uh, entire Section 5.4 was, uh, was uh, debated and adopted by town meeting. Be, beware of that date, April 30th. The reason it was done is because the state had allowed by statute uh, the muni uh, municipalities to be able to check uh, for criminal background and uh, actually fingerprinting of, of vendors, which you'll see in 5.4.1, I believe. Yes, this, this list right here of all these various people. Um, the state was allowing that municipalities to be able to have that requirement for issuing licenses to these people. The problem was the state uh, statute did not take effect until May 4th. 2012. This, provide, this, this bylaw was adopted, or at least approved on April 30th, some days prior. So this little clause at the end was saying, okay, well, it only takes effect on May 12th, or sorry, May 4th on 2012, essentially when the state statute does as well. And also the, the other one is that as long as the Attorney General approves, and that's what the other general, uh, Mass General Law references too. So this was just essentially a, I would call a sunrise clause that allows the bylaw to go into effect when the state allows you to. Conversely, if you didn't have that in there and the Attorney General found that town meeting had approved this before it was the state statute, it could have been, it could have been disapproved. So this was, this was in there for that reason since that's long gone, we decided we'd take it out, and that's the reason it's in this. Um, the second one is there's a typo again. There's section 7.1.11. There are two O's. Get rid of one. That's the reason for that. Oh, and this one is, is, I think, the town council's favorite. Um, the difference between therefore and therefore. And that's in section 8.1.5, 1.6, and 9.7. There were some changes for, for uh, you know, changing from his to that person and so forth, which we already went through in Article 24. But in this one, apparently there is a distinction between therefore without an E and therefore with an E. Um, therefore without an E really just means, uh, was intended to mean uh, for that purpose, thank you. Uh, whereas therefore with an E, means essentially consequently. So this is something of a subtle legal, legal distinction, but um, it is something that if it's in a legal document, it should be correct. And so that's the reason for trying to delete the E's from this. It's not for changing from the British spelling to the American spelling. Um, it, has, it has a legal connotation to it. Subtle it may, I don't think there'd be necessarily a lawsuit coming be brought because of it, but since it is intended to be a, you know, a correct legal document, we thought we should change it in this article. And bylaw committee report? Bylaw committee voted on um, January 30th to recommend this article to town meeting by a vote of four to zero. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 26. Are you going to talk? Oh, let me. Oh, okay. Article 26 is a little tricky. This is a motion to remove town meeting members from town meeting who have not um, been here at least half the, uh, half the meetings. The list right now, if, if voted the way it is, it would remove those people. But what we do is we ask each precinct chairman, chair to um, give us a report on what that precinct, the precinct members uh, feel. And if, if they have voted to remove the name from the list, it means they get to stay in town meeting. So we'll begin with the precinct one chair.
Sheila Mulroy. It's kind of embarrassing. (laughs) 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 Chair Precinct 1. Um, uh, Precinct 1 voted to remove John Arena and Sheila Mulroy, me, from the list to allow us to remain in um, town meeting. Okay, is there any, is there a second? Second, okay. Any discussion? All right, we will uh, vote on that proposed amendment. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. Precinct chair from precinct two. Do we have, oh yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Tony DiRezzo, chair precinct two. On April 22nd, we voted 17 to zero to remove both Francis Burke and David Decker from the list. And David Decker, okay. Is there a second? Second, any discussion? No? What? Okay, any, uh, I'm sorry, is there any discussion? None appearing. All those in favor of that proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Precinct Chair from Precinct 3. John Breslin, Precinct 3. Uh, we voted 20 to 0 to remove Danica Medeiros from the list. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Uh, Precinct 4, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Russ Graham, Precinct 4. At our meeting on April the 22nd, we voted to remove Ms. Cameron, Mr. McCarthy, and Mr. James from the list. Okay, is there a second? Oh, uh, discussion, Mr. Lesher? May I just ask you to repeat that, Russ? It's different from what the town clerk had. Mr. Graham? That is different? Yes. Oh. That was the vote of the members of Precinct 4 was to remove from the list All Mr. Three. McCarthy, Ms. Cameron, and Mr. James. Just to clarify, the Thank you. on town meeting. Just to clarify. To remain town meeting members. Thank you. Okay. Is there a second? Second? Is there further discussion? And appearing, all those in favor of that amendment, please raise your hand. And those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Precinct Chair from 5. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ed Ross, Precinct 5. Um, on the meeting on April 22nd, we voted um, Aaron Calvabachi to be removed from the list and Patrick O'Sullivan to remain on the list. Patrick O'Sullivan to remain on the list? Okay. Okay, is there a second? Second. Further discussion? Ms. Binder? Uh, Angela Binder, Precinct 5. That vote took place on Monday. On Thursday afternoon, I received an email from Patrick O'Sullivan um, asking me to plead his case to Precinct 5. He missed all of last year, and he would be missing this too, but he's attending Suffolk University. He's finishing up a master's degree in accounting. Um, Tonight's his last final. Good luck, Patrick. And he's going to be taking his CPA, so his CPA exam. So he would would like to remain on, and he will be um, more attentive to attending once he is out of school with his master's degree and back home. I forwarded the email to the town clerk who forwarded it to um, Precinct 5 members. So I would be in favor of having him remain as a town meeting member. Okay, what I will do is I will take that as a separate amendment once we have disposed of the first. But Ms. Alvarado, you had a comment? Oh, same thing, okay. So we have the first amendment is to um, to remove, which name? I'm sorry. Erin Calvabachi from the list, which means she would stay in town meeting. Once we've voted on that, we will vote separately on the, the, uh, your amendment. Any discussion on that first 
amendment. Not appearing, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and now I will, I will accept that as an amendment to remove the name of Patrick O'Sullivan from the list, allowing him to stay in town meeting. Is there a second to that? Second. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Struble. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff, Jeff Struble, Precinct 7. Um, I am in agreement with uh, keeping Patrick on town meeting. He is uh, quite uh, attentive to, uh, to town matters. It's just at the moment he is, he is uh, swapped uh, to getting his master's. So uh, once he's done with that, I'm sure he'll be back here in full force. Any further discussion? All those in favor of that proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion carries. Uh, precinct 6, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Atena D. Chair of Precinct 6. Um, we also have our names in the wrong category because um, uh, we voted to keep James Bonazzoli and Robert Mandel on town meeting, and that was passed unanimously. So you're moving to remove them from this list to, 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 to stay on town meeting? Yes, okay, thank fine. You. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? None appearing. All those in favor of the uh, proposed amendment? Those opposed? And the motion carries. And what are we up to, Precinct 7? Precinct 7, Chair. John Lippett. Uh, John Lippett, Chair of Precinct 7. We voted at our precinct meeting to remove both uh, Carrie Donnell and uh, Linda Phillips from the list so that they would remain in town meeting. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All of, yes? Ms. Hillary? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jennifer Hillary, Precinct 7. I just wanted to share that the process that I have witnessed in our precinct meetings to evaluate whether a person remains on town meeting or are removed from this list or not seems very informal. We typically accept an indication that the person wants to stay on town meeting either from the town clerk or perhaps another person present as a reason to remove them from the list. And I've been querying whether in this um, particular climate, whether that's enough. And I, I wonder if as town meeting members we want to consider in the future whether we ask that folks give a little more detail about why they want to stay on town meeting or perhaps why they miss town meeting. I know many of the folks on this list who are being removed have so indicated, but there are others who we have not heard from personally about their um, activity on town meeting. And I understand that perhaps in the past town meeting struggled to retain members, and so we gave a lot of leeway to town meeting members, but I know in the past couple of town meeting elections they've been contested, and there's a lot more interest in town meeting, so perhaps it is incumbent upon us to require a bit more in this process. I think if we saw select board members or school committee members missing more than half of the meetings, the public would have a lot more questions and everyone in this room is elected and I believe that we should hold similar high standards of ourselves. So my comments again are not about our particular vote tonight, but for us to consider this at our next precinct meetings, you know, will we raise the bar and ask a bit more of our fellow elected town meeting members? Thank you. Okay, actually, we were still discussing the last proposed amendment on uh, the precinct seven. Is there further discussion on that? None appearing. All those in favor of the last proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed, the motion carries. Now, any further discussion on the main motion as amended? Not appearing. Oh, yes. Jeffrey Quorum, Precinct 7. I, I want to echo a little bit of what the, the previous speaker said. And I'm also curious as to about these voters, of uh, these um, town meeting representatives. This was attendance from last year. And I wonder, have these uh, people that we are asked, that have asked to remain on town meeting, have they actually attended any of the sessions of the current town meeting? Um, and certainly, you know, we heard an excuse the, the reason for one, but you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm, you know, maybe reluctant to keep people on town meeting if they missed all of last year and haven't come to any of these sessions. But perhaps I, I, I will. 
think, think something to think for for uh, the subsequent town meeting in, in November. Okay. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. Brown? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Ian Brown, Precinct 8. Um, I want to call town meetings memory to, I would say, I believe it was last year. Uh, and I guess my response is the reason that we don't ask for more is sometimes the reasons why people don't give more info is that it is personal. Um, so for me, my name was on that list at one point, and the reason I was on that list was uh, I had missed stuff because I was in the hospital. Um, now, I don't particularly like disclosing all of that to an enormous body of people. And so that's my sentiment on this is that it's personal. If they don't want to have to give more details, they shouldn't have to. Thank you. Uh, the town clerk has just informed me, just as a uh, point of interest, there were 120 members with perfect attendance. Do we have any further discussion on this article, this motion, excuse me? Not appearing, all those in favor of the motion under Article 26, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion carries. Now, Ms. Alvarado moves that we take Article 3 from the table, which is the um, instructional motions. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion carries. All right, we have, I believe, five, if they are still um, going to make it. Uh, just from my pile here, Mr. Lippert is first. Are you going to make your motion? Hi, right, John Lippert, uh, Precinct 7. Uh, instructional motion, should I read it? Yes, yes. Okay. Since I direct the Select time. Board School Committee and any other bodies or individuals considering the use of the parcel of land near the Burbank Ice Arena recently authorized for purchase by Town of Reading by Article 22 of, of the 2019 Annual Town Meeting to include as an option for its use the construction of an early childhood center or any other approach that would allow the school system to expand kindergarten and pre-kindergarten enrollment and to reduce or eliminate the use of temporary classrooms at the elementary schools. In addition, the school space study should incorporate these possibilities. Is there a second? Second, Mr. Lippitt. Uh, I just feel that we talked about a number of possible uses for this parcel, uh, and it didn't seem to me that the early childhood center or the needs of the schools for the, uh, the elementary schools and the kindergarten, pre-kindergarten were um, discussed much. I just wanted to make sure those were on the table. Uh, I've tried to word this six, um, uh, flexibly enough with the other or any other approach that anything could be, for example, people have suggested somewhat tongue-in-cheek that we could move Town Hall to this parcel and have Town Hall be our early childhood center. Or maybe the RMLD offices could move there and we could use the property with the RMLD. <laughs> but just so that as this property is, is considered for its for future use, that the opportunity of using it to have an early childhood center uh, be facilitated, not necessarily at that location, uh, be on the table. Thank you. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the instructional motion, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion carries. Our second instructional motion, again, is Mr. Lippitt. Second, and I promise last. John Lippitt, Precinct 7. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, direct the Select Board, School Committee, and any other relevant bodies to consider and make consider and make recommendations on the membership of a Reading Building Security Committee. Uh, the language was used earlier was team, whatever um, is relevant, I think we know what we're talking about here. That would review and make recommendations on ways to achieve appropriate cost-effective security at the town's schools and school facilities, for example, athletic fields, as well as town government buildings and facilities. Said Reading Security Committee should include maximum feasible participation by elected officials in town and town meeting members as well as members of the public, especially school security teams and parents of school-aged children. Furthermore, a goal of the committee should be to share as much information and assessment of progress on town security with elected bodies and the public as is prudent and possible. Is there a second? Second, Mr. Lippitt. So I just, I am not yet comfortable with the amount of information that's been shared here tonight or has been promised to be shared in information. Actually, a process has been talked about, but no content. 
And for example, I abstain from the vote on this. I very much want the security of particularly our schools and our town to go forward, but I didn't feel I had enough information as a town meeting member to authorize spending $4 million. For example, at a minimum, I would like to know what percentage is being spent on the schools and what percentage on the town. If it were 100% on the town, I would have voted against it because my priority is our schools. Similarly, there were five categories that were put up there. I'd like to know what percentage is going into those categories. If 100% of it is going to surveillance cameras, I would have voted against it because I don't think that is going to provide us any significant. Um, and I think that kind of information can be shared without harming or risking anybody's security. Also going forward, I would like to, I would like to know what the plan projects and what actually happens in terms of accountability, in terms of how many of those red areas went to yellow, how many of those yellow areas went to green. I don't know, need to know specifically what they were or specifically what buildings they were, but we need to have that kind of, a, kind of accountability to spend $4 million. And I hope this process would then engage more of our elected uh, members and other members of the public, which I believe can be done safely uh, here to uh, move this forward. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. I'll get him. Mr. Grant. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom Grant, Precinct 4. Just a, a clarifying question. Would it be a, a new committee, or would it replace the committee that's made up of town employees right now? My intent was to replace the committee that was identified. I, I believe the answer was it would replace? Yes. Yes, OK. Further discussion, um, Mr. Friedman? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Andy Friedman, uh, Precinct 4, and um, member of the Select Board. Um, I, I um, would like this amendment or, or, or this um, instructional motion to be considered, perhaps modified, um, so that it meets the need, needs of most uh, town meeting members. The, the reason for that is that uh, on Monday night, many of us, in, including myself, were not pleased with the level of involvement of elected officials uh, and the public. And, and the reason, and I respect uh, the, the people who brought up their concerns about we don't want to bring too many people in because it will um, decrease the safety of our, of our buildings. I think that argument um, has merit, but only to a certain extent. For example, I don't want to see the blueprints of, of where all the security cameras are going, et cetera. But I, I think uh, not allowing elected officials to do their job of oversight um, at the level of okay, which buildings are being selected and, and why? Um, and what, what is, how do we measure uh, success? How do we watch for cost overruns or how the, the money is spent? Someone here earlier mentioned, we like to see how every nickel is spent here. I'm not asking for that here and I, I don't think that's the purpose of this instructional motion. Um, but I would like to see something uh, like this passed. I voted for um, the security program that was proposed uh, with some reluctance, but I, I, it, it was a choice of either having that or not, and I chose to vote for it. Lastly, I think one of the most important things that we can do in town government, all of us, is to increase the level in, of trust in government. Everywhere I look, I see that most people don't trust the, 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 the government, whether it's federal, state, or local. And I think it's incumbent upon us to increase that level of trust. And to do that, I think we need to be allowed to fulfill our oversight function in, in a meaningful capacity. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. O'Neill. John O'Neill, Precinct 4. I think this kind of, kind of discussion that we had earlier when we were voting on the bond issue was a sort of discussion, or the beginning of a discussion that we should have had before this process began. You know, there is, to me it's, you know, the process and greater involvement is just not a philosophical thing. As a, you know, longtime manager, you learn the hard way, if you don't learn this lesson, is that if you, I want to see a, an effective, the most effective security system we can have. And the best way to achieve that is to have as much involvement beforehand of the people who are going to be mostly impacted. You know, and to me, that's my biggest reservation. Is in fact, that didn't happen, and it's not too late. So I think to the extent that we can have some active participation, because we're also talking about, you know, in privacy. You know, I think we should have that discussion as a community. Also, the, the fact that I may actually want to have more security versus less, because we talked, we, somebody raised the question about whether it should be 4.5 or 5 million or whatever, and the response was is that, you know, we'll come back to you, but the, we'll come back to you in what, by what criteria, and it was mentioned that the criteria would be to the extent that we think the additional cost be worth the additional security. Once again, I don't think that's just for a very small group to make that determination. And it depends on what we're talking about, what population. The school population is the most vulnerable population we have in the community. So what I would do with that population and those public buildings is one thing. What I would do with other town buildings may be another thing. Like for the library, that's something that probably every single person here is going to be impacted, as well as some of the other town buildings. So to, to that extent, I certainly, you know, support having, you know, the intent of this instructional motion. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, on the far, far end, yep. Alicia Williams, Precinct 8. I trust, trust our town manager and I trust our superintendent to do what needs to be done and I am against forming any sort of committee. Thank you. Up in the far corner here? Yeah. Oh, well. Mr. Bonazzoli. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. James Bonazzoli, Precinct 6. Um, as I had discussed before, I'm very comfortable with what was outlined. I can see why we want some oversight, but uh, a smaller committee can move faster and more nimble. As uh, one speaker said, these are the experts within our community, within our buildings and uh, safety. And I trust them. And I also trust the elected officials there before me to, to do the oversight that you're required to do. I shouldn't have to now oversight you to tell you to do the right thing. That's why I trusted you to elect you. And that's the level of trust. Now, the, the world has, may have changed a little bit, but not for me and not in the community of Reading that we don't trust you to instruct the people that you're overseeing. Um, I don't believe in this article at all. Um, again, I, I think we have had so many capital projects that this one is not any different. Is it about security? Yeah, and, and I'm in the cybersecurity field. I don't understand why anybody else in this community or this committee needs to be part of this process. I'm voting this one against. Mr. Oh, Mr. Lelisher, I'll come to you after that. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I just want to remind the, the mover and the body that as, as part of my discussion earlier, I did say we would report on broad spending categories as the mover has requested before any money was spent in executive session. Ms. Alvarado? moderator um, to the original writer of the motion um, can you clarify whether you're requesting that the current steering committee 
um, which consists of town manager, the superintendent, who else is on there, and the deputy chief, and and the four others. Um, is, your, is the intention to replace them, uh, or is the intention to have the elected boards and committees join them? Thank Mr. you. Mr. Lippitt. My intent would be to have the elected officials join them. I can just make one other comment while I'm here. In terms of engaging the public and informing them, many of these things that, well, I don't know, I would guess that some of the things that are being proposed will not be effectively implemented without the support of the public. We talked about um, letting people um, tailgate going in a door or, block, or um, uh, you know, blocking open a door that's not meant to be an entrance door. If the public doesn't understand that and engage in this process and believe in it, it's not going to work. So if we want the implementation to be effective, the public has to be engaged and, um, and believe in this process as well as the rest of us. So, uh, but I hope I answered your question to add rather than to reply. Further discussion? Mr. Sasso? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. So a lot of things going on in my mind right now, trying to sort this all out. Um, but a couple quick things. So first of all, I, I have to say, um, what I seem to be missing from this, and I've heard it a number of times about the oversight responsibility from a legislative perspective. I mean, we literally have different parts of government here, right? We have the executive branch effectively that are running operationally our, our schools and our town, and then we have the legislative uh, that has oversight responsibility. Oversight responsibility isn't just financial. I mean, there are pieces to understanding what's being done. And, you know, with all due respect, I don't expect the boards or the commissions to be experts, but they do have, they do have a role. And that role is some sort of a sanity check on the details of what's going on. And I, I'm, I guess my first question is, so, um, uh, uh, Bob, when you talk about reporting to these folks, are you talking about including in that report some of those details or just financial? Mr. Lillisher, can you give me an example of some of those details? All right, I'm going to scare people. Um, so are we talking about facial recognition software that's going to be included? Are we going to, I think someone else mentioned, scan license plates? Are we going to ping people's Bluetooth on their cell phones when they walk in a building? I, I mean, those are types of details that would scare me. And I would like to know, I think the elected officials and the people with oversight would like to know, are those the types of things we're talking about here? Are those the things that are going to be implemented? Because to me, those are real privacy concerns that clearly differentiate this project from any other thing this town has ever done. Mr. Lillisher. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Um, all the things you just listed, well, almost all of them, are extremely expensive. I'll give you an example. There's an elementary school that one school spent $5 million on building security. One school. We're spending $4 million spread out of over 16, 18 buildings. Um, we can't afford to do anything that's really creative and scary. <laughs> you just can't. Remember, part of this is redoing the dispatch center. Um, there are other, if you will, costs in common to be used by all buildings. Uh, infrastructure, and then the specific work at buildings. Once you whittle down the amount of money that's left, it just can't have these fancy things. There's not intense software. Um, again, this is capital. This is not policy. Some of the concerns I'm still hearing are policy. This is stuff. This is capital. This is not how people act, how they behave, what the rules are. This is physical hardware, software, stuff. Right, but you're buying physical hardware stuff that supports your policy. I mean, you've, you've already kind of walked through the process of defining what types of things you want to do, and obviously the capital then supports that. It, there, it's, not, it's certainly not in a vacuum. Um, I, I, let me just finish for one minute here. That, that I, I mean, so I like the idea of trust, but I also like verify. I, I, I'm also in the intent of that I don't necessarily see the need to include the boards on that particular committee, but I would like to know that the boards are actually getting this level of detail update. I mean, you mentioned earlier, if you presented something to the library trustees and they said, we don't want that in our building, well, how would they know? I, I, because it kind of sounds like that's not information you would even share with them. I, I, now, maybe I'm wrong. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to, to say that's what you said, but that's kind of what I've continued to hear. And if you have to you know, 
look, we have congressional oversight. Well, maybe we do. Um, and, and, <laughs> and they have, you know, secret and top secret clearances, and they can get whatever information. We can put these guys on NDAs, right? I mean, th this, is not, this is not difficult. So I, I, I guess I just, to me, and I, and, I, and I hear what you're saying. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that that's what you guys are planning to do. I, and I, I recognize that there's a lot of other issues with that. But the bottom line is that those are the types of questions that I think we want to make sure. And, and I am absolutely comfortable in trusting that with both the executive and the legislative branch in agreement on that. And I just don't see that. Thank you. Mr. Lelisher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, specifically as to the library trustees, they, they expressed a concern to me. And I assured them that before we did anything in that field, we would consult them. Um, that's the only factual way I can answer your question. Um, specifically in terms of uh, security cameras, we have some now, we may have more if this goes through. The security camera itself can be used in a number of ways. We have explained in the last uh, session town meeting, we're not looking to increase staffing so they're to be used forensically. That means that they're going to record things and if there's a reason, if something happens and there's a reason we need to go back to them, we will. If an incident is reported live, those cameras certainly may assist dispatch and public safety uh, doing their job. Um, but they are, you know, where policies would come in is how long do you keep footage? Two weeks, four weeks, what's your, you know, capacity for storage and so forth. Um, but again, that's a policy issue. That's not do you have cameras or not. It's how do you use them that maybe people are concerned about. So I think you really need to think long and hard about the stuff that we're buying versus the way it's used. Um, I just, I can't think of anything that we're thinking of doing that is like a violation of privacy or scary uh, all by themselves, just by their existence. I really can't. Further discussion? Mr. Halsey? John Halsey, Precinct 1. Relative to this particular instructional motion, I think there's some things that we need to think about from a common sense standpoint. We have seven members of this committee now. Um, I, I think the way I understand this proposal, um, we add the select board, we add the school committee, and we add the library trustees. So roughly speaking, that group of seven people who have worked very effectively and quite productively um, for beginning actually almost three years ago and, and effectively working um, on a day-to-day -day basis over the last 18 months, we now need to read in roughly 15 or 16 people and catch them up a three-year window that has been intense over the last 18 months. I would submit to you that that will slow the security of our children down exponentially. And therefore, I feel that this instructional motion is one that you should reject. I would further say that, <clears throat> to echo Mr. Bonazzoli's words, uh, it's been my experience over the last five plus years that working with the team that I've seen working on this project, um, there's been no lack of information. There's been no inefficiency in completion of projects. And monies have been followed and cared for um, in a very studious way. I would suggest that accepting this instructional motion would cause a tremendous slow down and delay to the security of our children and i suggest strongly that you rec that you that you turn this motion down ms landry uh ann landry precinct five uh, I supported Article 16, and I was I, ha I was prepared on Monday night to vote in favor of Article 16, as I think it is appropriate that the safety of our uh, the public, the staff, and especially our children is is our first priority. Um, 
that being said i was prepared after leaving uh, town meeting monday night to offer an instructional motion this evening um, based on the concerns that had been raised relative to additional community uh, input and oversight by elected officials um, to offer an instructional motion to that effect uh, i i was encouraged that um, a lot of the relevant stakeholders on both sides of the equation came together um, over the last couple of days and i was not part of that group um, to, to come for to come up with a path forward to address some of the concerns that had been raised um, and i was glad to see that the proposed plan forward includes updates in both open and executive session um, for for all of the elected boards uh, as well as more specific budget information that would be provided once the bids are accepted um, i was hoping um, Bob or anyone else who's involved in that process, if you could just clarify a little bit more what level of detail would be provided to the boards in open versus executive session, specifically, I think, around budget, um, budget information, you know, what the, what the breakdown is and the type of spending. Would some of that be provided in open session, provided it doesn't uh, reveal anything about vulnerabilities? Could some of that be provided in open session so that um, members of the public and town meeting would have that information mr lillisher um, thank you mr moderator um, the kind of information i'm at least imagining some would be fine in public um, and some with more detail would probably be better served in executive session so uh, to answer your question yes the, you know there'd be a certain amount shared in open session that really wouldn't jeopardize uh, safety and for instance would answer the question well wouldn't answer the question of schools versus town. I honestly had never thought of it divided that way. But it would certainly address things like construction spending uh, versus other uh, types of spending. Uh, and to go, you know, I don't think we ever want to get into the building level. I think that would be a mistake. Um, but an executive session, we could look at, after the fact, how much is town and schools, for instance. I wouldn't want to say that in public either. Uh, again, um, earlier, Mr. Huggins explained that the amount of money that a building requires is not so much based on its square footage or its age, it's based on its design. So when you walk into a building and the central office is not visible from a security standpoint, that's something that should be corrected. That could be a big building, a small building, a new building. Well, it's probably not a brand new building because they don't build them that way, but it could be a very old building. Um, so again, um, yes, we would share a certain amount of summary level data in public and more in executive session. When I'd been Ms. thinking Landry. earlier this week about, oh, can I? Yes, Ms. Lander. Uh, when I had been thinking earlier this week about an instructional motion, and based on some of the comments folks had raised, I'd been thinking about, well, would it make sense to appoint a, li a liaison from uh, each elected board? Although I actually do think it's preferable that all board members have the same access to the same level of information. So I think that the approach that um, the different stakeholders who came together earlier this week came up with ach achieves that goal of the different elected boards having in, you know, to the extent they're in executive session or open session, the same level inf of information. Um, I think that's, that's wise. I do take my oversight responsibility seriously as a select board member and uh, plan to fulfill that. One piece of the instructional motion that I think, I'm not quite sure the way it reads, but um, something around the, providing the amount of, um, of information uh, to the public, as much information to the public as possible. And I think there's some language about possible and some language about prudent. And I think, I don't know if we could see the, the language, but it, um, I think because it's important to thread the needle carefully about how much is relayed to the public, um, but so as not to jeopardize um, security with respect to revealing any vulnerabilities, we may not actually want to release as much information as possible in case that were to jeopardize uh, vulnerabilities and, and create a safety risk. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Sylvester. Paul Sylvester, Precinct 3. Um, We've asked that the instructional motions be provided in a 
written format. And one of the things I notice is that we can't see the instructional motion. And I have a concern in that I thought I heard discussion, and it could be my old ears, um, in the beginning that said that the school committee, the library group, and that the board of, uh, that the select board would be replacing the existing committee. And then just a few minutes ago, I heard what sounded like a flip in the other direction, said that they would be augmenting the committee. Um, and, and I have a concern when uh, there's the possible discrepancy in terms of what we're voting on. Um, I do want to say that I'm not in favor of the instructional motion. Um, I believe that our select board is more than capable of asking the appropriate questions, and they may take place in executive session. I'm willing to, uh, to uh, grant that. Um, and I've, by virtue of uh, being on a couple of boards, I've had the chance to work with the town manager and a lot of the other staff and they have my complete faith. And uh, I believe it's because they've earned it. So um, I would urge us to uh, not vote in favor of this. Further discussion? Mr. Lippitt. <coughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, John Lippitt, Precinct 7. Um, first of all, just a couple clarifications. It does say uh, release as much information as is prudent and possible. I put that in intentionally because I recognize that that's an issue. <coughs> Secondly, what it says is direct the select board, school committee, and any other relevant bodies to consider and make recommendations on the membership of the committee. So it doesn't say the whole board should be on it. It, it doesn't say any of the board members should be on it. It just says they should look at this and make recommendations for who should be on this committee. Uh, secondly, there's no intent in here to slow anything down. We voted the money tonight. It's going to go forward. The committee's there. This is just saying, let's take a look at this and see who should be on this committee. Uh, last two comments. Spending decisions are policy. So we can't differentiate the fact that we're deciding to spend $4 million on capital from a policy decision. It is a policy decision. And secondly, the last thing that makes me really uncomfortable is, as I hear this, even if we share, say, percentages versus town versus school or whatever, that's happening after the fact, after the decisions have been made, not with input from uh, the a broader audience. Uh, and that I find troublesome because that is making policy. And as I said, if this were 100 percent town and 0 percent schools, I would have voted against it in a heartbeat. Further discussion? Mr. Lelesher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, for at least the third time tonight, that information will be shared with the committees in executive session, I'm sure, before anything is spent for their feedback. That was my point. Further discussion? No, no. Oh, yes. Thank you. Caitlin Mercurio, Precinct 2. Um, so the Department of Homeland Security has actually put out a guidance document on how to put committees like this together. Um, and their recommendation is to form a broad committee um, with many of the groups that the motion has included. Um, and they also go on to talk about sort of um, different roles that the committee members have, right? So there's sort of a more core group. There are members that form a, more of an advisory role. Um, so I will be supporting this, and I, I recommend, um, I can send it out to anybody for reading. Just, just follow the guidance document. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Nancy, Dr. Precinct 1, I'm going to support this amendment in regard to timing. My understanding is that this committee has worked diligently and thoughtfully for three years, and I don't believe they took three years to put any of our children or our residents at risk. I'd like to do this right, and if this takes a little time, I think it's well worth it. I'm going to support this. Further discussion? Oh, yes, in the, in the back. Ms. Williams. I don't, Alicia Williams, Precinct 8, I don't um, support this. And I just kind of want to point out that we have a $46 million school budget, and I don't know the town budget off the top of my head, but it's 112? 
total. Uh, the whole budget is 112, um, and we're worried about four million dollars. I think we're looking at the wrong thing. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, in the middle. Thank you. Heather Klish, Precinct 7. Um, I have a few things on my mind. First of all, thank you for the additional information and the rep repeated information, the refresher that was given tonight, and I appreciate the steps toward greater collaboration. I do support this amendment and there, because there are a few things that are on my mind. Um, in addition to the Department of Homeland Security guidance that's easily available online, there's a surprising amount of information that's just publicly available online at the DHS webpage, including a model of that matrix, um, that, that advises on having a core team, having great collaboration, broad collaboration with elected officials, and the public, I think that seems like sensible guidance from, um, from some of the authorities in this realm. I, I, I deeply support these moves toward higher security for our students, for the teachers, for personnel at the library and town offices, and all of the patrons of the library. I'm also comparing the level of detail that we so far have received, and it's been great to get the overview, with the level of detail that we got on the water tower and the discussion that we just had on the water tower tonight, that in fact is more typical for this appropriating body to receive that level of detail. I understand that there are good reasons to not go into the detail of, of, of what exactly are the systems that we'll be implementing. Having voted for the security appropriation earlier tonight, I still do have this lingering concern that comes, I think, from the gap of information that we normally get and what might be prudent to get. My concerns are stem from things that are just, my, I have a pretty active imagination. And when we don't have great level of detail, I'm concerned that I may have just voted for something that I would never vote for if I had had that level of detail. My personal thing is, what if I just voted for chain link fence around my son's school? That's not something I want. I don't think that's something that we're talking about here, but we don't really know. Now, our, our, elected, select, our elected boards, our select board, our school board, are the ones that are most immediately accountable and responsible to the voters, to even this body, for ensuring that the will of the things that have been expressed here and might be expressed through the public forums will be followed. And so I am really supportive of just a little bit of more formalized oversight um, in how these dollars will be spent by incorporating some elected officials right onto the active board that's making decisions real time rather than having to revisit and go back if feedback from these boards says, yeah, that's not really what we wanted. That, in fact, might slow things down. And those are reasons I'm supporting this amendment. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Brown? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ian Brown, precinct date. I move the question. I require, is there a second? Second. Why is a two-thirds vote? Do I still have my counters? I do. All those in favor of ending debate, please rise. Twenty-one. Fifteen. Fifteen. Twenty-three. Twenty-three. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. And those opposed? Six. 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 Four sixes. Vote being 87 in the affirmative, 24 in the negative. The question has been moved. We will now proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the instructional motion, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion does not carry. 
The next one is Ms. Binda. Actually, you have two. Uh, Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, the first instructional motion is move that the town meeting instruct the Finance Committee to examine authorized but unused debt and to develop a policy regarding if and when it should be reviewed by town meeting and revoked or replaced by a new vote and a new authorization. Such a policy should be presented to town meeting in a warrant article at the November 2019 town meeting. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Binda. Um, this uh, instructional motion comes out of Article 15 and a desire to use previ previously authorized debt for the lighting part of the Turf 2 project. Um, it was decided that that wasn't the best path forward, but it was suggested that I present an instructional motion that may have the same result. I reached out to um, select board member Mark Doxer, FinCom members, um, Karen Herrick and FinCom Chair um, Eric Burkhart, and I also reached out to the town manager for any uh, suggestions on how to word this. Um, a lot of the wording comes from um, select, uh, select board member <coughs> Mark Doxer. Um, what this does is ask the FinCom to develop a formal policy and procedure for keeping track of authorized debt and to bring unspent authorized debt to town meeting. The purpose is transparency and to remove authorized debt for projects not moving forward. Well, it's, it's actually the wording of it is to just bring, bring it forward after per period of time to either revoke it or replace it by a new vote and new authorization. So I'm not trying to force a decision. I'm just asking that a decision be made. Further discussion? Yes. Uh, Sean Brandt, Precinct 8 and member of FinCom. Um, I had intended to bring something like this up at our next meeting anyway in light of what happened last week. So whether the instructional motion passes or not, I think it'll get at your objective of um, discussing a policy. So. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Struble. Hi, quick question. Um, does this be a one-time action? or a recurring action? Uh, no, it's to, it's to develop a policy. So whether or not it's done on a yearly basis or however, it's, it's, it's to a repeated policy, but it's up to the FinCom to develop. It's not just for the No, it's to develop a policy to look at unused, un, uh, authorized but unused debt. It was suggested maybe if after two years um, it's not spent, then it should come up. We have authorized debt that hasn't been used after five years, so it is a recurring thing. But again, it's up to the FinCom to decide when. Further discussion? Mr. Lasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I'll just speak on behalf of the town accountant who's not here, even though we're supposed to be legally separate. Um, she does have such a policy. The only outstanding um, debt that's authorized but not issued is this for the Birch Meadow Fields. And the only reason she has not asked town meeting to rescind it is because a discussion either 18 or 20 months ago with the Recreation Committee suggested that they were about to make full recommendations on the Birch Meadow improvements, including the lights, and they still have not done that. So I don't know if she's going to have a problem with FinCom doing it, but just so the body is assured, she has such a policy in practice. It's been so I, I guess my question would be then, why wasn't that money used? Why wasn't that considered? A and why wasn't it considered, you know, back in January? Mr. Lerlusher. Again, because the Birch Meadow Recreation uh, Subcommittee has not yet as I understand it, they've done a survey that have not made a full recommendation, nor has REC voted on a path forward with Birch Meadow improvements. She was waiting until they do that and then would, you know, make a decision. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the instructional motion, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Ms. Binder, your second. 
uh, move that the town meeting instruct the select board to present a warrant article at the November 2019 town meeting, which one, revokes the Birch Meadow Field Lighting Authorization or reauthorizes the debt for the remaining four fields or authorizes the use of the debt for the general Birch Meadow Master Plan improvements. Such a warrant article will be developed by the select board working with the Recreation Committee and the Birch Meadow Master Plan Subcommittee. Um, is there a second? Second. Ms. Binda. So specific, this is specific to the Birch Meadow lighting and I'm asking that uh, something be done about that, either to revoke it, reauthorize it, or apply it to the Birch Meadow project. Again, I'm not making a recommendation. I'm asking that something be done because the, the debt authorization is five years old. Um, and uh, what I didn't want to do, it was also suggested that I make an instructional motion or that it include a recommendation to the Recreation Committee to present something to town meeting, to the select board, have a public hearing. Again, I have attended a lot of the Birch Meadow, or the, a lot of the Recreation Committee meetings. I've attended the Birch Meadow Master Plan Subcommittee meeting where they presented the findings of the, um, of the survey that was done. Um, they're moving along. I don't know what their plans are. I don't know what their time frame is. I don't want to hinder that. I don't, I don't want to hinder the Recreation Committee. If the select board feels that they're not moving quickly enough or has recommendations or if other people need to be involved, I feel that the select board themselves can make that request of the, rec of the rec committee. I didn't want to be the person to do that. I, I don't want to, that's, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm just asking that something be done with the Birch Meadow lighting in in uh, really relation with the rec committee. Is there further discussion? Mr. Lollishire. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I did suggest such a motion to Angela. Um, in keeping with the last part of your comments, I would ask you, though, to move it back to April next year because I think the November time frame is just too tight. The select board can't reasonably make such a decision without feedback from recreation unless they just do it unilaterally. I will accept that friendly amendment to April. Is yes. there any objection to that change? Not, not appearing, that will be considered the main motion then. Further discussion? Not appearing, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion carries. Our final one is Mr. Ensminger. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bob, do you have my, my motion? I'll, I'll start reading it. Uh, it's moved to instruct the bylaw committee to consider for approval the following amendment to the Reading Home Rule Charter. Said amendment shall be presented first to the November 2019 subsequent town meeting for approval, and then if they approve to the Reading voters at the 2020 annual town election. Uh, the effective uh, words in section two, the, the motion further states to amend section 2.6 vacancies in the Home Rule Charter to delete the following language. It's the language pertaining to town meeting's right to remove members. Uh, some of the uh, rationale here. This is to start a discussion. This has to come back to town meeting. It's a, okay, uh, we're just, it's the, yep, the second and third paragraphs are the ones in question that would be taken out if uh, bylaw looks at this and they want to do it that way. We are retaining uh, everything in the first paragraph and the fourth. The fourth is very important because that maintains the right of the uh, caucus to fill vacancies. So that's, that's not going to be affected. So uh, why do this? Well, it is kind of an aggravating process and very few people, and we've heard discussion about the merits of how we're doing this tonight and the criteria we should be using, in the end, very few people are removed. Ironically, the few that were removed tonight are from the precinct that has the highest vacancies in town meeting, so we've just created three more. Um, it is a little more democratic to put this back in the hands of the voters, let them decide. One way uh, to provide them with the information, uh, one part of the information could be that the uh, town clerk, Laura, I think the attendance records are public information for yes. town meeting. That's that, correct. Yep. That could be published for all incumbents seeking re-election. Uh, for their duration of their one, two, or three-year uh, terms. 
Uh, it would free up the caucuses to talk about much more productive stuff, like what's on the warrant, uh, do we need charter amendments, uh, what have you. So um, just this would be the first step if you vote for this tonight, and we can have a much fuller discussion in the fall. Thank you. Okay, I actually failed to ask for a second. Is there a second? Okay, further discussion? Yes. Is that, that okay, better? Bruce? Okay. Yes, Mr. Struble. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff Struble, Precinct 7. Uh, Dan, question. You know the bylaw committee can't touch the charter. Is this just to get the, mo the to get, make a first stab at this, to bring it back to town meeting? Yes. Okay. Further discussion? Yes, Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. Um, I am, am not going to vote in um, favor of this, uh, just as it may have worked against where someone taken off a precinct that don't, doesn't have enough people. I was concerned about one of the votes tonight in Precinct 5 because that person is taking a seat at a time in his life when he can't be here, um, when someone else may want that seat. And uh, people are always able to come back and run again. But these are three-year terms if, we, if someone's out for a long time, it doesn't get back to the voters for three years, so I'm not in favor of this. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Ms. Hillary. Jennifer Hillary, Precinct 7. Uh, in addition to what Ms. O'Neill stated, by removing this, it would not allow us to fill open seats for the fall or the next spring, uh, this would leave, potentially leave a seat open for three years. So my understanding is if we decide to remove um, members from town meeting at this juncture in April, in November, we could potentially fill those seats. Am I correct? So I'm opposed to this because I would prefer to have all of our seats filled. Thank you. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the instructional motion, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion does not carry. All right. Ms. Alvarado, do you have a motion for us? We have a motion to adjourn sine die. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. This town meeting stands adjourned. Sine die. <laughs>